Folks, Black Star Network is here. Hold no punches. I'm real um, revolutionary right now. Background. Support this man, Black Media. He makes sure that our stories are told. Uh, thank you for being the voice of Black America, Roller. Stay black. I love y'all. All momentum we have now. We have to keep this going. The video looks phenomenal. See, this is the difference between Black Star Network and Black-owned media and something like CNN. You can't be Black-owned media and be scared. It's time to be smart. Bring your eyeballs home. You dig?
Today is Wednesday, August 16, 2023. Coming up on Roland Martin Unfiltered, streaming live on the Black Star Network. The Georgia DA who has indicted Donald Trump and 18 others wants to start that trial in March. Oh, yeah. Fannie Willis is not playing around. The survivors of the 1921 Tulsa race massacre will get another chance for reparations after a lower court judge dismissed the case. Tomorrow, Solomon Simmons will be here to update us on what happened. A 13-year-old Mississippi girl is forced to give birth to her rapist baby due to the state's strict abortion ban. A 13-year-old raped, and because of their decision, now has to care for that child. All right, folks, comedian Chris Spencer is going to be joining us, talk about his new movie. First time he's been the director's, in the director's chair. It's called Back on the Strip. Hits theaters on Friday. Plus, uh, we continue to pay tribute to uh, Clarence Avant. Uh, I had a conversation with Reggie Hutland, who did the documentary The Black Godfather, uh, when it came out, and we'll show you that conversation. It is time to bring the funk. I'm Roland Martin Unfiltered on the Black Star Network. Let's go. He's got whatever the miss, he's on it. Whatever it is, he's got the scoop, the fact, the fine. And when it breaks, he's right on time. And it's rolling. Best believe he's knowing. Putting it down from sports to news to politics. made it clear I'm ready y'all ready let's get it on she uh, has made clear that she is ready to try Donald Trump and his 18 co-defendants uh, on March 4th she is asking a judge to set a trial date of March 4th uh, for all those accused of trying to overturn the Georgia's 2020 uh, election she also asked to schedule arraignments for the defendants for the week of September 5th, the filing indicates that Willis is seeking to quickly initiate the process of sharing the discovery with all 19 defendants and wants to keep her word to hold a trial within six months. Willis wants to give defendants until 10 days after the arraignment to opt into reciprocal discovery. If they opt in, all parties shall serve discovery materials then in his possession to opposing counsel no later than September 29th. Trump and his cronies were indicted on 41 counts, including racketeering, violating the oath of office, and forgery. Uh, his former chief of staff, Mark Meadows, uh, they now, they are trying to get this moved out of state court to federal court. It's a whole lot of drama going on. Let's talk about it. Robert Patillo, host of People Passion Politics, News and Talk 1380 WAOK out of Atlanta. Rebecca Carruthers, vice president, Fair Election Center, Washington, D.C. A. Scott Bolden, attorney. Uh, former chair of the National Bar Association and D.C. Chamber of Commerce's uh, PAX. He's also out of D.C. as well. Robert, I want to start with you there in Georgia. Uh, and, and that is, um, all these people that are out here speculating, oh, she should wait. This idiot Dan Abrams was like, oh, she should drop her case now that Jack Smith has moved forward with his case. Her case is totally different from his. There's some overlap. Uh, but what she is making clear, we don't have to sit here and try to wait till after the election or wait 18 months. Her whole deal is... Guess what? If this was any other trial, we're ready to go. Well, uh, this, there's a little bit of gamesmanship going on here. The, the trial's not going to commence in six months or eight months or wait, 18 months. It's just not physically possible in, full, in the Fulton County Courthouse. It's just not something that can physically happen. But why? Hold on. No, 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 no. Hold, hold, wait, wait, wait. Before you, before you go there, explain to the audience why. Why can't okay, it happen so in six months? Okay, okay, so one, you have 19 co-defendants with 41 charges, uh, different charges for each co-defendant. Donald Trump has 14 charges. Really, Giuliani has 13 charges. Some people have one charge. Some people have five charges. You're already seeing uh, Mark Meadows, he's filing to move uh, to sever his case and move that to federal court. Each one of these 19 co-defendants is going to file a motion to sever, and they're going to have 19 separate hearings for that motion to sever. Regardless of how that comes out, they're going to have discovery. They're going to have fights over discovery. They're going to have motions calendar. 
years, then you have fights over the motions calendar. Even getting that number of witnesses in to, testi uh, to testify, uh, getting one case in Fulton County done in six months is a Herculean effort. I I've, before, I had a case that started in 2013 and ended in 2019 uh, before. So the, I, I think what uh, DA Willis is attempting to do is just what we're seeing from Mark Meadows, which is the reason Mark Meadows is moving this case to federal court is because he has a, a, a agreement with Jack Smith to testify against President Trump. She is setting this timeline out, so particularly these lower-level figures, not the top-line figures of Trump, Giuliani, Powell, Eastman, uh, not those people, but the remainder of them, giving them the opportunity to cooperate with the state and enter, enter into agreements, and then setting out a calendar to get those things done, because the sooner you get those things done, you can put more pressure on the, the big dogs in the crime syndicate to, uh, to move their cases along. This is very much analogous to the young thug YSL case, where you saw people like Gunna and other people get their cases resolved early. Meanwhile, Young Thug is still awaiting trial. And even in that case, it took two or three years to indict the case. Then they've been they've waited 18 months now to, in, just to try to seat a jury in the Young Thug case. So the idea that the Trump case will move faster than the Young Thug case, I just don't think is physically possible. But I do think it's gamesmanship on her part to try to push more people to cooperate. Uh, Scott. Yeah, you know, um, I agree with Robert. The, I would offer a friendly amendment the court's trial schedule is in play as well. On top of all the motions, uh, they have a trial calendar for other cases. And so all of the defendants at some point are going to move to go to federal court because they're going to want to um, get out of state court. Uh, and I don't think they can avoid getting um, uh, pardoned, if you will, even if they're in state court. What's scary about federal court is, is that if you get a judge who believes in ancillary or pendant jurisdiction, sorry to take you back to law school, Robert, but those cases could stay in federal court. I doubt it because <clears throat> the standard for review uh, requires them to be committed these acts in the ordinary course of their presidential or appointed duties. And I'll be honest with you, being involved in a criminal enterprise and undermining votes and trying to steal an election at the state level just isn't going to qualify. There's precedent for this in a prior case, um, the name escapes me, but in one of the Trump cases. So um, getting to trial as a practical matter is going to be tough. Secondly, or lastly, let me just say this, you also have this schedule of these other cases that you're kind of fitting in around those trial dates that have been set already. And even if they've been set already, those dates could be moved off uh, or, or moved upon or moved out or rescheduled. And so the wheels of criminal justice tend to move slowly for all the reasons that Robert gave and all the reasons that I've given. You know, Rebecca, um, the thing here, uh, it's amazing to look at some of these uh, folks. R Ruth Marcus with The Washington Post writes this column by saying, oh, my goodness, is this going too far? Uh, uh, in this case, dealing with Donald Trump, which to me is sort of like, okay, that's stupid. What do you mean uh, too far? And, uh, you know, all of these people, I, mean, I just love how they all are just, you know, uh, everybody is just sort of, uh, you know, just, I won't say making stuff up, you know, but it, it, this, this idea that, oh, this guy is just so different and that we, sh we should just sort of just change uh, how we deal with him. I'm sorry. If you get indicted four different times, you deal with it. There are other people that have been indicted uh, in multiple cases in different parts of the country, uh, and uh, we don't hear all of these excuses. And, and I dare say the reason Donald Trump keeps doing what he's doing is because he's never held accountable. As long as you keep making excuses, as long as you keep creating this whole separate, uh, uh, you know, a uh, uh, thing here, it, it goes to show you, again, the problem. And I think that that really, for me, is, um, you know, the, the big problem here. I mean, like, I was laughing. I'm, I'm setting a video up right now. I was laughing. I mean, listen to this nonsense by those idiots on Fox News. Uh, Greg Gutfield, truly one of the dumbest people, okay? I don't even know why he is even having conversations on a news network when he is a flat-out unfunny comedian. But this is literally him talking on the number one news show on cable, uh, sitting across from real people. 
And this is the stuff that's being fed that I think feeds into this whole narrative. Oh, this was just this is just too much for the Donald. This is what federalism allows states to do to enforce their, their laws here. And we'll see to your point that what you said is exactly right, Judge. This his state of mind, if they have evidence showing his state of mind is different than what he claims, he'll have a he'll have a You don't think this is that. totally over the top uh, as a jet for I mean, th even when but you, everything you say makes sense, except it's all bullshit. It's well, all nonstop. We know this is designed to banish and isolate and to destroy a political outsider who predicted this. Chuck Schumer, remember he said, yep. don't mess with the oh, intel you agencies. Are so right. Don't mess with the intel agencies. They'll keep. They'll arrest your team and keep it off the field. You, but I, just, I, I think, think the question. Do you, do you not, do not think he's done anything? No, oh, I to deserve I, any of this. He this. is probably one of the most troubling, consequential figures in history. But no. He doesn't deserve any of this. And by the so, way, why didn't they indict him until he announced he was running for president? Well, they probably I mean, had to give do me a break. I don't, this is what federalism allows states to this. do to enforce their Oh, he's their, one their of the most team. troubling, um, consequential. Uh, I mean, Rebecca, that, that literally is what these people are running around. And then and again, and then you got some people in media like, oh yeah, I think it's too much. No, if you if you. Right now, Arizona is looking at investigating him. He might get indicted in Arizona. People have people forget they were trying to stop the election in multiple states. In Michigan, in Wisconsin, the list goes on with other states that are reviewing this. Personally, I do appreciate that D.A. Willis is setting an aggressive timeline as far as with the court's calendar. And the reason why I appreciate that, just like the defendant, Donald Trump, and the rest of his other 18 folks, um, they have the right to a speedy trial, but so does the American public. We watch, we watch the, these events play out three years ago. And for all these people on Fox News and even um, in the Washington Post um, yesterday, one thing that I want to point out is whatever happened to states' rights? I thought all these people for states' rights. So shouldn't a state have the right to determine if they're going to enforce the laws in their book? And if DA Willis saw that there was violations of Georgia law, then she has every right. The state of Georgia has every right to bring prosecution against Trump and his um, co-conspirators. So I, I, I'm excited that she's being very aggressive. And, like, I heard Robert's point, but one thing I want to point out about the YSL cases and Young Thug is that she, you know, her her office had the ability to prosecute 10 people at one time. Sure, Young Thug, Young Thug which is the biggest fish in the YSL group of cases, um, yeah, he's just now getting his um, day in court, but we still saw the occurrences around the YSL gang We've seen that prosecutions have already started. So I expect some of the co-conspirators um, to flip. And I think by her being aggressive with the court dates, um, it's also going to apply pressure for some of those folks, i.e. Mark Meadows, to go ahead and flip and turn on Trump. I I'm just literally sick and tired of people, Robert, who throw out that, oh, this is, like, too much. We, as the American people, we we can't handle this. Oh my God! <laughs> let let me be. Well, I need people to understand. Uh, Had Richard Nixon not resigned, this would have happened to Nixon. See, I, I'm tired of this note. What's etched in stone above the Supreme Court? Equal justice under law. There's supposed to be one legal system. And so, I'm sorry if you did it. If you got to face 10 trials, 10 indictments, so be it. But I am not going to sit here and play this silly little game of, oh, this is just the world can't handle. We just can't handle the possibility of seeing a former occupant of the Oval Office have to endure this. And then the story is, oh, my God, what happens if he gets convicted? The Secret Service, they're not going to allow him to go to prison. I'm sorry, Robert. Can you please show me a statute where the Secret Service can say, yeah, if you're convicted in a courtroom and sentenced to prison, we have the right to say you can't go? If they are, if, if the law says they must protect him 24 hours a day, guess what? It's going to be some Secret Service agents sitting their ass outside of a prison cell watching his ass. Well, a couple things, Roland. One, I agree with the people who say this is just too much. 
This is just too much to have a president commit this many felonies uh, and still be walking around uh, as a free person. Let's be for real. If anybody else that you knew, if somebody just came in and to apply for a job sweeping the floors at the Black Star Network, and they said, hey, I'm currently uh, under indictment in four different jurisdictions for 92 counts that carry a, <laughs> to a penalty of maybe uh, up to 1,000 years in prison. Uh, also, I was just found liable for rape a couple months ago, and my previous business got found liable for $2.5 million in fraud. Can I sweep the floors at Roland Martin Unfiltered at the Black Star Network? Nobody would hire that person. So, yes, this is entirely too much. Uh, but at the same time, let, let's kind of talk, think about this conceptualization around a head of state not being able to be imprisoned. Right now, Imran Khan in Pakistan is serving a three-year sentence for not doing a tenth of what Donald Trump had done. So you mean to tell me our legal system is weaker than the Pakistani legal system? You can look at Niger, where President Basum is currently in custody, being held by the military for not getting Boko Haram under control and selling out their resources to France. You mean to tell me Niger can jail their former uh, their former leader, but America can't? What will happen is Donald Trump will be transport, transferred to one of the very nice resort prisons in South Georgia, down in Jefferson County. I had one of my older clients go down there, and uh, it was great. I, uh, he, uh, I went to him. We were doing his appeal. He said, look, man, don't work too hard. It's great down here. I said, what do you mean? He said, well, no, but on the outside, I wake up at 3 o'clock every day. I work a 12-hour day. He's like, in here, we got 500 pounds of cable. We have a spa. We have therapy. We have a, a all-you-can-eat uh, burritos. They gave me a puppy to do puppy therapy. Well, Donald Trump will be fine. He'll be in a very nice resort prison. Secret Service will be around outside to make sure no one bothers him, and he will do his five-year mandatory minimum sentence. Remember, the Secret Service is under the Treasury Department. They are not a military branch. If they, if if the idea is that the Secret Service will stop Donald Trump from going to prison, Secretary Yellen is in charge of the Secret Service and will tell them to take him to prison. As long as he is safe, secured, and monitored, he will be completely fine. And we have to get, the, get out of this idea that we have monarch or kings in this country, you can be held liable just as anybody else. They will just simply adjust the rules to make sure you can be safely kept and you won't get shanked. This is like, Donald Trump won't be going to Oz. He will not be going to The Wire or anything like that. He'll be in a nice club fed uh, and he will be okay. But I do think that this case with Fonnie Willis is the case most likely to put Donald Trump in prison because there's not really a way to plea out of it. There's not a way to get a pardon. There's not a way to get clemency. There's a mandatory minimum sentence. Even the Jack Smith cases, there are ways for Donald Trump to come out of it with a guilty conviction and not serve jail time. This is most likely what will put Donald Trump in an orange jumpsuit. I, I, I just, I just, just laugh absolutely uh, over and over and over again. Uh, just this. Oh my God! This, this is just too much. Nah, not enough for me. Hold tight, one second, y'all. We come back. Uh, we're gonna talk about uh, the three survivors of the Tulsa race massacre. Uh, may get, they're getting another shot in court this time before the Oklahoma Supreme Court. We will explain next on Roland Martin Unfiltered on the Black Star Network. Y'all, do me a favor. We need you to support us in what we do. First of all, your contributions absolutely matter. Trust me, we're independent. We don't have millionaires and billionaires sending us checks. So when you donate, uh, you are allowing us to be able to pay staff, pay reporters, do all the different things. And so do me a favor, send check and money orders to P.O. Box 57196, Washington, D.C., 20037-0196. Cash app is dollar sign RM Unfiltered, PayPal R Martin Unfiltered. Venmo is RM Unfiltered. Zale is rolling at rollingsmartin.com, rolling at rollingmartinunfiltered.com. Our goal is to get 20,000 of our fans on an annual basis, contributing at least 50 bucks each. That's $4.19 a month, 13 cents a day. Uh, and so if you if, if you can't give that, totally understand. We got people who've given more. We appreciate every dollar that you've given. What that does raises a million dollars, which allows for us to be able to fund what we do. Uh, all of this, folks, between this show and the six other shows on the Black Star Network, it's $195,000 a month. Numbers are real. They're just simply real. Uh, and so we know the value of black owned media, but we also have to support it. And so please do so. Uh, don't forget also download the Black Star Network app, Apple phone, Android phone, Apple TV, Android TV, Roku, Amazon Fire TV, Xbox One, Samsung Smart TV. And be sure to get a copy of my book, White Fear, How the Browning of America is Making White Folks Lose Their Minds. Proceeds for that book go right into the show. Uh, and so get it at Amazon, Barnes & Noble, Books A Million, Target. Download your audio copy on Audible. We'll be right back. Question for you, are you stuck? Do you feel like you're hitting a wall and it's keeping you from achieving prosperity? Well, you're not alone. 
On the next Get Wealthy with me, Deborah Owens, America's Wealth Coach, you're going to learn what you need to do to become unstuck and unstoppable. The fabulous author, Janine K. Brown, will be with us sharing with you exactly what you need to do to finally achieve the level of financial success you desire through your career. Because when I talk about being bold in the workplaces, I'm talking about that inner boldness that you have um, to, to take a risk, to go after what you want, to speak up uh, when others are not. That's right here on Get Wealthy, only on Black Star Network. Next on The Black Table with me, Greg Carr. The United States is the most dangerous place for a woman to give birth among all industrialized nations on the planet. Think about that for a second. That's not all. Black women are three times more likely to die in this country during childbirth than white women. These healthcare systems are inherently racist. Um, there are a lot of white supremacist ideas and mythologies around black women, black women's bodies, even black people that we experience pain less, right? Activist, organizer, and fearless freedom fighter Monifa Akinwole Bandele from Moms Rising joins us and tells us this shocking phenomenon, like so much else, is rooted in unadulterated racism. And that's just one of her fights. Monifa Bandele on the next Black Table here on the Black Star Network. Me, Sherry Shepard, and you know what you're watching, Roland Martin Unfiltered. Folks, a story out of Houston, Texas uh, that's gotten a lot of national attention uh, has now resulted uh, in the guilty verdict for uh, A.J. Armstrong Jr. He was a young man in 2016 who was accused of uh, shooting his mother and father in the head, Don and Antonio Sr., uh, as they were asleep. Uh, Antonio Armstrong was a star football player at Texas A&M University. Uh, both of his parents uh, had, a, had a fitness company, and the first two trials uh, ended in uh, hung jury. Uh, but they tried him a third time. Uh, they, of course, uh, had about 40 hours of witness testimony over 11 days, uh, and the uh, jury deliberated for about 10 hours before uh, rendering this decision. It literally uh, came down just a few moments ago. Texas versus Antonio Armstrong Jr. We, the jury, find the defendant, Antonio Armstrong Jr., guilty of capital murder as charged in the indictment. It's signed a four-person of the jury. Does either side wish for the jury to be polled? Yes, sir. All right. <coughs> All right, ladies and gentlemen, when I call out your number, I'm going to ask you if this is your verdict, and you say yes it is, or no it is not, all right? And these are your jury numbers, not your panel numbers. All right, jury number one, is this your verdict? Yes, ma'am. Okay. Juror number two, is this your verdict? Yes, ma'am. Juror number three, is this your verdict? Yes, it is. Juror number four, is this your verdict? Yes, it is. Juror number five, is this your verdict? Yes, it is. Juror number six, is this your verdict? Yes. Juror number seven, is this your verdict? Yes, it is. Juror number eight, is this your verdict? Yes, it is. Juror number nine, is this your verdict? Yes. Juror number ten, is this your verdict? Yes. Juror number eleven, is this your verdict? Yes, it is. And juror number twelve, is this your verdict? Yes, it is. This was a strange case uh, because um, so when when uh, his parents were shot and killed, um, they allowed for him also to to attend the funeral. Uh, he's he had support of his family members. Now, what was e equally strange uh, is that uh, the defense literally tried to suggest that it was his brother who did the murder. 
Uh, so it was, I mean, this story got, got uh, 2020, uh, did uh, an expose on it, uh, and it was just one of those just, just strange stories uh, that, uh, again, that attracted a lot of national attention. Uh, there were uh, folks who were trying to get uh, him, uh, first of all, family members were literally, uh, and I know some of the family members were uh, literally, uh, um, they were having, raising money for his defense. There were billboards uh, that were put up in the city as saying, uh, the, the free AJ. And so, uh, it, but the prosecutors, uh, they contended uh, that all the evidence pointed to him uh, as the one uh, shooting and killing his parents. A.J. Armstrong Jr. is 23 years old. This happened, he was 16. Uh, he now uh, faces life in prison without the possibility of parole. And so, uh, certainly uh, just uh, sad all the way around uh, when you think about uh, this particular, uh, when you think about this particular story. Uh, and again, uh, you know, yet loss of life of uh, two, uh, two parents, both African-American, uh, and now this young man, again, it happened when he was 16 years old uh, in Houston, uh, and now he um, now faces life in pro. And this, um, this here is a photo of A.J. Uh, with his father, uh, A.J. Armstrong, uh, a a. Armstrong Sr., uh, and that young man now in prison uh, for the rest of his life. When we come back, uh, we will talk about uh, the case out of Tulsa. Uh, they get an opportunity, the Tulsa Race Massacre survivors, they get an opportunity to plead their case to the Oklahoma Supreme Court. We'll explain that next. You're watching Roland Martin Unfiltered right here on the Black Star Network. Hatred on the streets, a horrific scene, a white nationalist rally that descended into deadly violence. Soil, you will not white people are losing their damn minds. As an angry pro-Trump mob storms the U.S. Capitol, we've seen shock. We're about to see the rise of what I call white minority resistance. We have seen white folks in this country who simply cannot tolerate black folks voting. I think what we're seeing is the inevitable result of violent denial. This is part of American history. Every time that people of color have made progress, whether real or symbolic, there has been what Carol Anderson at Emory University calls white rage as a back. This is the rise of the Proud Boys and the Boogaloo Boys. America, there's going to be more of this. There's all the Proud Boys, guys. This country is getting increasingly racist in its behaviors and its attitudes because of the fear of white people. The fear that they're taking our jobs, they're taking our resources, they're taking our women. This is white fear. Next on The Frequency with me, Dee Barnes, the shooting of Megan Thee Stallion and the subsequent trial of Tory Lane. Megan has been treated like the villain. The experience that Megan went through is something that all Black women face when we are affected by violence. This is something that's called massage noir. There's a long history of characterizing Black women as inherently bad in order to um, justify our place in this society. Next on The Frequency with me, D. Barnes. It's John Murray, the executive producer of the new Sherry Shepard Talk Show. This is your boy, Earthquake. And you're tuning in to Roland Martin Unfiltered. After Laura Court judge dismissed uh, the case last month, the Oklahoma Supreme Court says it will consider a reparations case from survivors of the 1921 Tulsa Race Massacre. But the state says it will not consider a settlement with the three survivors. Demario Solomon Simmons, civil rights attorney, founder of Justice for Greenwood, is joining us now. He's representing those victims. Uh, and so, uh, so, so explain what happened here uh, in terms of uh, the Oklahoma Supreme Court agreeing to hear. You tweeted that this was one of three things that need to happen. 
Yeah, good to see you, Roland, as always. And thank you for having me back on the show. I miss you guys. Listen, this is a huge victory and a huge development for us. As you stated, we were dismissed with prejudice by our trial court judge, uh, George Caroline Wall. And in the state of Oklahoma, every case, every case that is appealed goes to the Oklahoma Supreme Court. And then 99% of those cases are then sent back down to the Court of Civil Appeals. And then that takes a, at least a minimum of a, of a year process. And then at that point, the Supreme Court could consider taking the case or not. So the first thing we needed to do was to convince the Supreme Court of the history historical significance of this case, the ages of my three clients, 109, 108, and 102 years old, and the impact that this case will have for all lawsuits in Oklahoma, that they should actually hear the case themselves. They only do that in about 1% of the cases that are filed here in Oklahoma. And I'm happy to report here on Roland Martin Unfiltered that they actually agreed with us to hear our case. So it's, it's still, it's stunning to me the defiance of Oklahoma, to, to act as if um, there were no public officials involved, to act as if uh, this is no big deal. I mean, they literally uh, are trying to burn it down uh, a second time. Absolutely, Roland. And this is why I continue to say that this case, this case right here, will decide and prove if this is a nation of laws or a nation of men and women. It will prove, do, do black people have a right? Do they have rights that people have to respect? Or is this 1857 when Dred Scott, the judge and Dred Scott said, black people have no rights that a white man is bound to respect? Because when you have a scenario here where it's the largest, most destructive, deadliest, and most costly domestic terrorism, a terrorist attack in the history of this country, 40 blocks burned to the ground. Over 12,000 people suffered the massacre. Up to 3,000 people were disappeared, never to be heard from again. Over 8,000 people was confirmed to be homeless, to live in tents and squalor for up to a year and a half. You have hundreds of insurance claims that were filed and not paid. You have hundreds of photos. You actually have video from 1921 showing the destruction. And you still have living survivors, three flesh and blood human beings who suffered and remember the massacre. And if these people cannot have a day in court, because that's all we're asking for at this time, Mark Roland, we just want our day in court to prove our case, have our experts coming from around the nation and testify about what happened and what the nuisance that was created and what would it take to fix the legal term or to abate the nuisance. That's all we're asking for at this point, a day in court. If we cannot have that, then what case can we get justice for? If we cannot have this victory, then all of us are at risk because it means that you can have the absolute worst thing happen to you and this court system will not give you any legal redress, won't even hear your case in court. Questions for the panel. Scott, you're first. Yeah, I don't think there's any doubt from a legal standpoint or practical standpoint this happened, but were there lawsuits filed before or at and around the time of the Tulsa massacre? Because I know you're gonna, I haven't seen all the cases, but you've got standing issues, you've got statute of limitations issues. I understand the nuisance argument, but in the end, this is decades later, you deserve your day in court, but what's your argument against the fact that you could have filed this lawsuit, not you, but a lawsuit or similar lawsuits could have been filed well before 2023? Man, great question, Scott, and I'm glad you, you brought that question. Uh, first of all, I want to say that there were lawsuits started to be filed two days after the massacre by the great B.C. Franklin, who is the father of Dr. John O. Franklin, the America's historian. And those lawsuits sat in the Tulsa County District Court system for 16 years. The court refused to hear them, and then they summarily dismissed them in 1937. And then the most famous lawsuit that was filed outside of our case was filed by my mentor. And I got a picture of him right here, Charles Overtree, who I will be in D.C. this weekend uh, attending his memorial service as he was the lead counsel of the cases that was filed in the early 2000s when I was a law clerk and a, and a, and a baby lawyer. And those cases were kicked out on statute of limitation grounds. I, didn't think, I don't think that was the right decision. I think the judge, the judge and the justice system error, those are federal cases. 
The unique thing about our case, Scott, I can't see any of you guys anymore, so I hope you still do. Yeah, no, we are here. Go ahead. The unique thing about our case is that it is a state-based case, not a federal case, and it's based upon our public nuisance statute, which has been in Oklahoma since 1910. And our public nuisance statute said, does not have a statute of limitation. It simply says that the, if the nuisance is ongoing, then you can continue to have a live case. And that's what we have here. We have a nuisance that started in 1921, but has continued since that date. There's never been any uh, issue that stops that nuisance. We have the right to go into court, and we feel very strong that the Oklahoma Supreme Court will, will look at this case, reverse it, and get us back into discovery. And let me give an example for everyone when, when we're talking about a nuisance continuing. About 12 years ago, the BP oil spill happened, and everybody remembers that that oil was spilling out into the Gulf of Mexico for about 45 days, millions of gallons of oil. So that was what we would call the triggering act, just like the massacre when they were dropping bombs, burning homes, killing people as a triggering act. But then once they capped that oil spill and the oil was no longer gushing out, but you still had oil polluting the ocean. You still had oil killing fish. You still had oil uh, polluting the air. And long as that oil is there causing a problem, it doesn't matter if it's one year, 10 years, or 100 years, that nuisance is ongoing and it must be abated. That's the same theory here. That's exactly what happened here. And we have cases here in Oklahoma that go back as far as 85 years where a nuisance is still continuing. You, Roland, if I may, so what's the public nuisance you're arguing in the case then? Race discrimination, racial oppression, racial violence, and the manifestations of that over 75 years? No. No, we're, we're, those are not the things that we're arguing. And I'm going to answer that question of what we're arguing, but I want to make this very clear as far as a procedural uh, scenario. In Oklahoma, and the lawyers, I know the lawyers understand that we have what's called notice pleading. That means, Roland and everyone else, that we have a very low bar. We basically have to say, hey, we had this happened to us, this is the claim we're making, and we want it to be made right. We don't have to be specific and particular about what our remedy would be. That is what our court kicked us out on. She said we did not provide a proper remedy, for, and therefore our, our, our claim fails. Well, she's wrong about that because since 1984 in Oklahoma is, is, is notice pleading. So we don't have to, even though we did, and we can talk about that depending on how much time we have, we don't have to come with the specifics of what the remedy shall be. So that, that's number one. But number two, Scott, as far as like what is the nuisance, one example, I'll give you one great concrete example. In 1921, the largest African-American owned hotel in the nation was owned by a man by the name of J.B. Stratford, who happened to be an attorney also. That hotel, not only was it the largest um, hotel in America owned by African-American, it was also the largest uh, employer in Greenwood, and it was a great source of housing and a tax base. That hotel was destroyed, burnt to the ground. It was never allowed to rebuild. It's still a vacant lot right there today where that hotel was located. That, pub, that, is, that is an example of a public nuisance because in Oklahoma, a nuisance is when you make property uninhabitable. uninhabitable. And what can be more uninhabitable than being burnt down to the ground and never allowed to be rebuilt? Rebecca. Um, sure. Thank you so much for being here tonight um, to talk about this. So even um, two years prior to um, the Tulsa um, 1921 um, was the red summer of 1919, where, as we know, over three dozen um, black communities across the country was also burned and looted and all of those things. Is there a broader legal framework that descendants of these massacres should be considering? Um, because just like to Scott's point, we all know that it was uh, formerly members of the government who backed and allowed for these atrocities to happen in the black communities um, a century ago. But what is the formal legal framework to actually prove that in court? Um, how, you know, what is the basis for us even thinking, uh, for us to even think about this even beyond Tulsa, but those other um, three dozen communities as well? Yeah, Rebecca, thank you for that, for that uh, question. And you're right, you know, what happened in Tulsa is, it's not unique as far as mass, as far as them attacking black communities. The thing that made Tulsa unique is the size and the scale of the attack and the destruction and the amount of $200 million in property damage, over 12,000 people impacted, 3,000 people never heard from again, et cetera. To your specific question, 
That's why our case is so powerful and important for us as a nationwide movement is because it is a real live legal case. It's, it is, it does have a theory that can work. We should win here on the law. And I'd say in other states where they have similar public nuisance statutes, this is something that we are looking at for other communities uh, across this nation, and everyone should be looking into that. And another thing that you should be doing if you are a descendant of one of these massacres is make sure you are organizing now and getting those stories and that information for those elders. One of the things that we do at Justice for Greenwood, besides our litigation, is we have a genealogy project called We Are Greenwood. And we're doing that. We, are, we have about a thousand descendants in our network. We take all histories and we do genealogy. So you can start putting those communities back together, bring together those resources. So when you are ready to advocate for policy or legal uh, redress, you have the right people at the table. Robert. Uh, kind of expanding on uh, Rebecca's point, uh, it seems that this is successful will open the door for uh, all sorts of litigation. You know, if I'm still alive and I got uh, bit by a bull, uh, by uh, one of those race dogs from Bull Connor, that seems that's a civil suit. You know, the descendants of lynching victims seems like they should have uh, their day in court. Can you talk a little bit about kind of the the breadth that this could open up to if we if the courts open up this uh, Pandora's box to allow civil suits for the descendants or for the living victims of racial violence, uh, all the way down to if you got a hose put on you by the cops, that's a city action, that's a state level action, and therefore you should be able to sue for the injuries uh, that you incurred during that period of time. Well, see, but see, I think this is where we have to make the distinction of our case versus what you're saying. Those are, those will be personal injury lawsuits, and those personal injury lawsuits will most likely be shut down because of statute of limitations. Now, not to get too technical, but you know, there is a thing called tolling statute of limitations, but it's very difficult to do. Most of those cases are going to get kicked out on statute of limitations. We're talking about legally, right? What are what is a legal theory that can survive in this legal system that we have to we have to practice in? That's the unique thing about the Oklahoma nuisance statute. It is something that does not have a statute of limitation if the nuisance is ongoing and continuing. And additionally, the, nu the nuisance is not for individuals. Our three living survivors are the three last survivors of the massacre. As a part of an abatement plan, there may be things in there that they can personally receive, but that's not what this case is about. It is a not about individuals. It is about the 40 blocks that was destroyed, the, the 1,515 homes that were destroyed, never rebuilt, and what that did to the community itself. That is the powerfulness of this particular lawsuit, and this is why it allowed us to move forward with this case in a real live action. This is not an academic exercise. This is not just uh, making a public PR statement. We have a law that allows us to be successful. Different laws in different states can be utilized differently. So I don't want anyone to think just because what we're able to do would automatically mean that you can, you know, your example, say, hey, I was bit by a dog in 1965, therefore I can bring a lawsuit in court. That may or may not be true. It depends on what your state statute says, what type of what type of laws are available there. But that's why the unique nature of this particular case and other public nuisance cases that are out there throughout this nation. There are, there are about 20... There are about 20 other states that have a public nuisance law that's very similar to Oklahoma. Ours has been on the books for 123 years since 1910. As I stated, they, we have case law where cases go back 85 years. In fact, the, Oklahoma's, the state of Oklahoma utilized opioid in the opioid litigation. They went back about 35, 40 years. So there's precedent for what we're doing here. And it, and it can be a model, but it depends on the state. All right, then. Well, tomorrow, keep us abreast. Uh, what happens next? So when uh, your, your particular date uh, before the uh, Supreme Court? No, the Supreme Court has no dates or guidelines when they have to respond back to us. Our next hurdle, the next thing that we're hoping to happen is that we get oral argument. We want an opportunity to be going in front of our nine Supreme Court justices, explain, answer those tough questions like these lawyers and Rebecca gave me. We look forward to being able to do that, answer those questions, and then for them to make a, de a, a decision. I will say this last thing, Roland. I did speak to the survivors, all three of them today, and they made it clear they wanted me. I told them I was coming on with you, and they said, hello, you know, they love you. Uh, you know, you're definitely up for red. You know, you his guy. They wanted to make it clear that, listen, they are they are definitely tired. You know, they're all over 102 years old, but they plan to be here for the long haul, but they're hoping and praying that the Supreme Court will give a decision 
ultimately on the ultimate decision as they've done so quickly on, on retaining the case. Uh, well, look, they are they have been fighting a long time uh, and we absolutely stand with them, give them our best. Uh, and uh, hopefully uh, the, uh, the Supreme Court of Oklahoma will do the right thing. All right. We appreciate it tomorrow. Thanks a lot. Thank you, Roland. Peace. All right, folks, got to go to break. We come back. Lord have mercy. How trash, how trash uh, are these folks in Florida? Uh, we got three stories we're going to talk about. Uh, and I'm telling y'all, I keep saying elections have consequences. And what happens when we do not do our part, we get crazies in power. We'll explain next right here in Roland Martin Unfiltered on the Black Star Network. We talk about blackness and what happens in black culture. We're about covering these things that matter to us, uh, speaking to our issues and concerns. This is a genuine people-powered movement. There's a lot of stuff that we're not getting. You get it, and you spread the word. We wish to plead our own cause to long have others spoken for us. We cannot tell our own story if we can't pay for it. This is about uh, covering us. Invest in black-owned media. Your dollars matter. We don't have to keep asking them to cover our stuff. So please support us in what we do, folks. We want to hit 2,000 people, $50 this month, raise $100,000. We're behind $100,000, so we want to hit that. Y'all money makes this possible. Check some money orders. Go to P.O. Box 57196, Washington, D.C., 20037-0196. The cash app is dollar sign RM Unfiltered. PayPal is R Martin Unfiltered. Venmo is RM Unfiltered. Zale is rolling at Roland S. Martin. Next on The Frequency with me, D. Barnes, the shooting of Megan Thee Stallion and the subsequent trial of Tory Lane. Megan has been treated like the villain. The experience that Megan went through is something that all Black women face when we are affected by violence. This is something that's called massage noir. There's a long history of characterizing Black women as inherently bad in order to um, justify our place in the society. Next on The Frequency with me, D. Barnes. I am Tommy Davidson. I play Oscar on Proud Family, Louder and Prouder. Right now, I'm rolling with Roland Martin. Unfiltered, uncut, unplugged, and undamn believable. You hear me? idiots in Florida, uh, all of their actions are having consequences. Uh, a black student group, they are actually having to change their name uh, in order to maintain their funding. Now, in response to uh, the new, the change in state law, the Black Male Achievers, a student organization at a community college in Tallahassee, Florida, uh, they're now having to explore alternative names like male achievers or scholar male achievers to ensure they continue to access necessary financial support. Florida Stop Woke Act prohibits student groups from receiving state or federal government funds except for student activity 
fees. Now, the law, widely seen as part of Florida Governor Ron DeSantis' anti-woke agendas, causing concern among the organization members, motivating them to respond to potential funding challenges. The law banning DEI programs went into effect on July 1st. Now, also happening in Florida, uh, protesters rally against the state's controversial black history teaching standards. Teachers, students, and activists took to the streets in Miami, folks, marching to the school board of, of Miami-Dade to voice their objections. Professor Marvin Dunn, who we had on the show yesterday, a psychology emeritus professor at Florida International University, organized the march. Protesters want board members to reject the new statewide standards requiring middle school teachers to instruct students about the benefits enslaved people allegedly gain from being enslaved. Florida is also facing a new federal lawsuit to block the anti-woke laws. The case filed by students and professors at New College in Florida names Florida Education Commissioner Manny Diaz, the Florida Board of Governors, and New College's trustees as descendants, defendants, uh, accusing state officials of violating freedom of speech by creating overly broad laws which are unconstitutional and restrict speech, speech on gender and queer identities, race, sociology, and feminist philosophy. Ron DeSantis claims diversity, equity, and inclusion in CRT programs are discriminatory, exclusionary, and a form of indoctrination. Now, check this out, folks. It's not just uh, that. Uh, if you want to show uh, a perfect example of some black folks uh, who uh, love to, frankly, uh, speak against black people for their benefit, uh, check this out. So, uh, you know the district that, that oversees uh, Disney World? Ron DeSantis has been fighting Disney. There was a lawsuit uh, involving them. Well, guess what? <laughs> You've got um, a black man who is chair of this new district. Well, you know what he's decided? He's decided uh, that, hey, you know what? We don't need these DEI initiatives. His name is Glinton Gilzine Jr. Glinton Gilzine Jr. Now, why is this important? Because this is the same Glinton Gilzine Jr. who, um, uh, who again, for the last seven years, has been head of the Orlando Urban League. Yeah, Orlando Urban League. Okay. Now I'm gonna show y'all who exactly who this who this guy is. Okay. Uh, I'm gonna show you exactly who this guy is. This is a photo of him right here. This is Glinton Gilzine. This okay. Let me pull it up. Uh, this is Glinton Gilzine Jr. Uh, and so what, what this, what this uh, group just did was they outlawed uh, all DEI in this district where Disney is. But in addition to that, they also uh, uh, struck any race-based uh, contracting in this particular area. Now, we reached out. We reached out uh, and wanted him on the show. Uh, and so, and this is what, um, and so we want him on the show. Still would love to um, uh, get him on. I'm gonna show you this tweet. Uh, you guys are gonna laugh about this one. I saw this tweet today. Uh, this was from a Republican, this is from this guy named Benny Jacquez, uh, who happens to be a state representative, Florida District uh, 59. Uh, he posted this tweet. Uh, it was great catching up with my friend, Glenn Gilzine, the new administrator of the Central Florida Tourism Oversight District formerly the Reedy Creek District that was what was ran by Disney. Under his leadership, they've abolished all DEI programs and race-based contracting. The district is now accountable to the people and no longer a corporate kingdom. Way to go, Glenn. Now, again, the guy on the left, he ran the Orlando Urban League for seven years. So, quite interesting, uh, Rebecca, uh, that somebody who would be running the Orlando Urban League, and anybody who has gone to, I mean, I was at the, the, the National Urban League Convention this year, uh, and they actually celebrated a number of DEI officers. And so here you have somebody who was being handsomely paid the last seven years by black people supporting DEI, and now he gets a new job with DeSantis, and now, oh, let's get, get rid of all DEI. 
So I'm going to be very careful how I say this, but if you are black in this country, whether or not you immigrated yesterday, your family was here for generations, like my family has been here for generations, or whether you are descendant of immigrants who've been here for a handful of generations, you need to understand the history of this country, and you need to understand the anti-blackness in this country. Unfortunately for, uh, for, uh, for um, Glenn, his background is... Um, his grandparents immigrated over from Jamaica, and I, I really hope his grandparents really gave him the history of why they immigrated over here or to the U.S. from Jamaica. I hope his family really talked about what it was like with the decolonization um, of Jamaica when black folks took uh, took back over um, the country of Jamaica. But what's unfortunate is we have a lot of people in this country, even those who are descendants of folks who've been here for centuries, who do not understand the history of anti-blackness in this country. So what happens in turn is that we now see black faces being used as puppets by conservatives um, to push an anti-black agenda. I know last week I mentioned mm. I would not be surprised if Tim Scott becomes the candidate for the Republican Party. And the reason why I firmly still say that is because it is very convenient to have a black face to push anti-blackness mm. as a way to further destroy black communities in this country. So uh, check this out. Uh, folks, um, so th this is what uh, he stated when they made this announcement. He said, our district will no longer participate in any attempt to divide us by race or advance the notion that we are not created equal. This is what Gilzean wrote. Uh, as the former head of the Central Florida Urban League, a civil rights organization, I can say definitively that our community thrives only when we work together despite our differences. Now, guess what? Mark Morial wasn't having any of that, so Morial uh, blasted the decision. Uh, quote, the National Urban League and our nationwide movement of more than 90 local affiliates are shocked and dismayed by Glenn Gilzee's betrayal of the values at the very core of our mission. Now, mind y'all, Gil Zinho was the CEO of the Urban League in, in, in Central Florida from 2015 to May. So, huh, June, July, August. Wow, it just took him three months to go, DEI is horrible. What were your ass saying the last seven years, Glenn, when you will cash those Urban League checks? Uh, this is what Moriel says. The National Urban League is more than a century. First of all, um, I'm go, this is actually this is what Moriel says. His rejection of diversity, equity, and inclusion principles is a rejection of the Urban League movement and the pursuit of racial justice itself. We vigorously and emphatically reject any implied association with Mr. Gilzean's current words or actions. His crass political expediency is all the more offensive given his, pre given his previous vantage point to the harm he knows it will cause. Now, the story lays out here, again, um, uh, and so this is what they claim. They claim that, uh, that uh, according to an internal investigation, uh, his previous leaders implemented hiring and contracting programs and discriminated against Americans based on gender and race, costing taxpayers millions of dollars. Now, here's what's laughable, okay? Uh, I guarantee you, uh, Robert, that if they show the internal report, and we're going to ask for the so-called investigation, we're going to see largely white folks have been making all the money. And see, this is what I've been trying to tell everybody what's going on. And they will use a black face in a white space to advance their initiatives. Mm. These people are going after everything. The Blum lawsuit, they're going after uh, the, black venture, uh, the, the black female venture fund in Atlanta. That's a part of it. Stephen Miller, they're going after black law firms. They're going, they're going after Kellogg's in corporate America. These people want to attack any and every program that has tried to level the playing field for African Americans and others, and they're not going to stop. Black people must be prepared. If there is any program that's involving a school, that's involving education, that's involving corporate America, law, media, you name it, these folks are going to sue 
everybody because they want to stop any and all black and minority advancement. And white women, y'all better speak y'all asses up because y'all are part of this too. Uh, well, Rowling, you know, this very much looks like South Africa towards the end of apartheid, when you saw the ruling white class entrench themselves in the bureaucracy and use the court system in order to maintain economic power. Part of the reason for the social strife and economic division that we're seeing uh, right now in uh, Johannesburg and Durban and other areas of South Africa is because of that process. We're seeing that play out right now in America as we're in the last days of the white majority. Uh, the, these are the death whistles of, of that them not going down without a fight. We saw the Supreme Court uh, in the North Carolina. Carolina and the Harvard decision saying that you cannot use race as a, uh, a factor when it comes to college admission. If you look at the Colorado case with the website designer, people think that case was about gay people. It was not. It was about black people. Because if you can have a, 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 a law saying that you can discriminate against the homosexuals because it's against your religious values, the Ku Klux Klan is a Christian organization. It can be against your religious values to serve African Americans. You have the same equal protection 14th Amendment analysis for either. So we've already seen this. Supreme Court, the side on the side of segregation in these cases. Next term, we're going to see a frontal assault on the Commerce Clause and Dormant Commerce Clause, which allows federal action to regulate private enterprises which happen in state. Um, uh, that's a lot, long, lawyerly way of saying the only reason you can't have segregated restaurants right now is because there's federal laws against it. If you have a state that doesn't have laws against that, within the next year to two years, that will no longer be illegal. And we will see the resegregation of America. They are now taking that same 14 the amendment analysis that we're seeing under equal protection uh, that they used in the affirmative action cases and using that to attack uh, from, uh, diversity, equity, and inclusion programs in corporate America around the country. Remember, Florida is just is, is patient zero for many of these things. These companies, these governments are seeing how far you can push it in Florida. And if it works in Florida, it will expand out to every other red state in the nation. We saw that with stand your ground laws. We've seen that with the constitutional carry laws. We've seen that with so many other initiatives, these six week abortion bans, they all start in red states like Florida, Georgia, Texas. And then if it works there, they can get it past the federal courts and it um, metastasize it through the entire system. And we'll see it matriculate across America if you don't nip it in the bud right now. So having these uh, these co-conspirators, these collaborators on their side, uh, which are uh, are working towards their goals of uh, resubjugating black folks for, for 30 pieces of silver, I think we understand exactly uh, how this happens. You repeat these people every generation. The, he's the same person who put us on the boats to get here in the first place and took a little nice helps the ransom to go with it when we got started. And I think we have to understand what is going on and fight it at every corner. Um, also, Scott, uh, understand this same uh, individual, uh, he also is the chair of the African American History Task Force there in Florida. The same brother. How, how ironic. <laughs> how many pieces of silver? Not ironic. <laughs> How many pieces of silver did these two, um, <laughs> you don't like me to use those words, let me stop. How many pieces of these, these American Negroes did they take? Did you, do, you, do we know? Because they sure look like they're taking pieces of silver. This is one of the most ignorant things about this anti-DEI. And the ignorance is, if you look at Gil's own statement, the former executive director of the Urban League, he talks about uh, our inability or our abilities will never be less than anyone else's. And we'll look like the same people or we have the same, like we, like these set-asides or affirmative action means that black people are underperforming in some way. And affirmative action in whatever field of human endeavor does not say that. That's not affirmative action. Affirmative action is even even in the playing field to correct <clears throat> historical uh, racial discrimination against a group of people, including brown people and white women, whether you agree with that or not. And so the basis for all of this, at least this this uh, getting rid of these DEI programs and set asides, is just rooted in ignorance. It makes absolutely no sense whatsoever. Oh, but, yet, but, oh, but, but Scott, Scott, it gets better. Oh, it gets better. Because, see, you know there are receipts. Uh, go to my iPad, Anthony. Um, this story here. After axing diversity and inclusion programs, hypocritical statements discovered from Tourism Oversight District Administrator Glinton Gilzee. Now, mind you, he's getting paid $400,000 to be the administrator wow. of this district. 
So, wow. uh, so check this out. Uh, so this apparently this guy Scott Maxwell, um, uh, this guy Scott Maxwell found this here, and oh my goodness, what does it say? In an October 2021 Instagram post signed by Gilzine, he noted that he was proud of Disney's diversity and inclusion programs. Oh yeah. Quote, oh yeah. No question quote, about it. Quote, I am, quote, I am proud that Disney has expanded its efforts to help countless black-owned businesses and entrepreneurs through its supplier diversity program. It takes everyone in our community to work together to end generational poverty, and I am thankful that we have Disney leading the way. Oh, ain't that mm. something? Ain't that something? Bro, uh, but you know, wait, 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 no, 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 hold up, hold up, hold up, I ain't, I ain't done. So again... Uh, what you have here uh, is, is this uh, nonsense here. Uh, and then, now the Urban League, this is funny. The Urban League on their website, uh, they actually have this posted, Magic Diversity Game Changer Glinton Gilzine. It's dated August 15, 2023, uh, which was yesterday. Uh, I'm not quite sure. Uh, and, and, and apparently it lays out how he's been the creator's leader. For stuff along those lines. Now, for, what's, re, what's weird is they say uh, to read the full article, click here, and it, it was something dealing with the NBA. Uh, I hit Mark Morial to find out what's going on here. But this is what we're dealing with. Here's a Negro who now gets $400,000, so now he now gets a check, and now his whole attitude, Scott, is, oh, we're going to shut this thing down for the rest of y'all black people because I'm getting paid by DeSantis. More, more ignorance. Let me tell you how much more, more ignorance is. That we know there's empirical data to support in corporate America and educational communities, in boardrooms, in law firms, media, that diverse organizations that, in, that have, practice inclusion and diversity are more powerful organizations, more powerful corporations, uh, develop better results, make more money, get better results. There's empirical data out there from a ton of research institutions and foundations, legitimate ones, that tell you this. So when you get rid of DEI, and when you and, and since when did we become some race-blind community where all of a sudden in 2023 we're all even, they don't see race, and therefore the e, there's this even playing field with socioeconomic and health numbers across the board. Those disparities are real between white folks and black and brown people. It's like the ignorance is ignoring the reality of those da that data, both in DEI data, a better results, and the data of the socioeconomic and health care, health disparities between these races. What is it just, it's our fault that we simply can't measure up in these numbers, and therefore affirmative action is curing that? That's not affirmative action. It's all bullshit, man. And, and, and I'll tell you something else, too. In Florida, that lawsuit about violating the First Amendment in regard to gay Americans, gay folks, black people and brown people need to bring that same lawsuit because I don't know how you get around that being a constitutional violation of your fifth, fifth, uh, First Amendment saying you can't say gay, you can't talk about black, you can't talk about diversity, or a college institution, or rather a college organization, got to change their name under that law. Somebody's got to bring a lawsuit because it's all constitutional violations of our First Amendment, period. But the thing that I'm trying to get us to understand here, um, Rebecca, is this is an all-out assault on black progress. It's an assault on black progress uh, getting into college. It's an assault <clears throat> on getting jobs. It's an assault of being able to grow uh, African-American wealth. And that's what they're trying to stop. Look. Look, when Stephen Miller, that white nationalist, that white supremacist, when they sued to stop the black farmers and Hispanic farmers from getting their money, oh, they didn't, they, $5 billion Congress set aside. Now, again, now, the white farmers got $25 billion. But then they're like, oh, no, this program, uh, the white farmers can apply for this. Hell, y'all had access to $25 billion. I just need everybody to understand. And again, all you simple Simon-ass people who are listening to these crazy yahoos on YouTube who don't know shit, when we're talking about voting and how these things matter, 
if you are a, and I, I ain't got no problem saying it, if you are a black person who is considering voting for Donald Trump or Ron DeSantis or Greg Abbott or any of these, or any of these Republicans, you, including Tim Scott, you literally are voting against black interests. I ain't got no problem saying it. Why, and I'm not basing this on emotion. I'm not basing it on anything but empirical data. Who are the individuals right now who, who, are, who are pursuing uh, the anti-CRT, anti-DEI, uh, anti-diversity, uh, anti-multiculturalism? These are Republicans. It is the Republican Party. The, pure and simple, y'all, in Florida, in Mississippi, in Alabama, in Louisiana, in Texas, in North Carolina, in South Carolina, in Tennessee, in Arkansas, and on and on and on. In Arkansas, it is Republican Governor Sarah Huckabee Sanders who says we are going to keep paying for European history AP classes. We are not going to pay for African American studies AP classes. We can go on and on and on. Who are the people who are attacking uh, affirmative action and admission policy? It is the Republican Party. And so, if you are black, and you right now are sitting here going, oh, you know what, I like the tax policy of Republicans. Well, guess what? If your ass are qualifying for AA contracts on the federal level, if you are qualifying for contracts for city, county, state, school board, federal as well, they are coming for you. They are coming for your children. Do understand that. And so I need these, these ignorant folk, Rebecca, to understand that how you vote and how you not vote has a direct impact on the type of crap that happens here. You know, Roland, I'm going to take it a step further. I'm going to speak on behalf of my ancestors right now. You know what? You want to you want to take back affirmative action? Cool. You want to take away DEI? Cool. Keep your little funky DEI. But run us our reparations then. If that's what we're going to do, let's cut a deal then. If you don't want affirmative action in this country, you don't want DEI programs in this country, then run us our money. Let's go ahead and cut that deal. The other thing, too, even thinking about the move to resegregate this country, bottom line, my ancestors never asked for integration. My ancestors asked for desegregation. And what desegregation means is equal access to economics and opportunities, equal access to be able to have housing, equal access to have opportunities to education, equal access to have economic opportunities in this country. That's what my family, that's what my ancestors asked for. We didn't ask for all this other stuff. So run us our money, and then let's desegregate. And I'm, and I'm real clear, Robert, I ain't playing footsie with none of these people. And I know there's some simple Simon-ass fool watching who was saying, oh, here you go, just give our votes to the Democrats. No, what I'm saying is you challenge those, you push those, you pry those who you vote for, but this is not hard. This is real simple. And I'll be real clear, all them Negroes who were talking about, oh, man, Brian Kemp, Brian Kemp has done some good stuff for black people. I went and checked. Black folks were getting 1% of all Georgia state contracts. Please, by all means, show me how good Massa Kemp has been to us. Mm. Well, look, Roland. Well, one, you ain't tell me it's four hundred thousand. I might sell some of y'all out for four hundred thousand. That's a good, good little chunk <laughs> of change. Some of y'all got to go. But, but look, I, for the people who are saying we need to have representation and the way you make changes to be on that side of the aisle, a couple weeks ago, Tim Scott and some of the other uh, Republican candidates uh, said to Ron DeSantis that your program of saying that there were bright sides to slavery, there were benefits to slavery, that's offensive to even us. You know, Tim Scott, the president of Black. Conservative Federation. A lot of black conservatives stood up to Tim Scott or stood up to Ron DeSantis on that. And what did Ron DeSantis say? Set your black ass up and get me some sweet tea. Uh, so, what's the point of having a seat at the table when you're still getting treated as a second class citizen? What exactly is the benefit of, of uh, supporting some of these par uh, parts that the Republicans are standing up for when it comes down to this acid test of just simply a level of respect, a level of understanding you as a group, a level of being able to uh, at least commiserate and push policy? forward that will benefit your community. Ron DeSantis and Vivek Ramswani are running to the right of Donald Trump. 
They're saying they will repeal the First Step Act. They're saying they will repeal the uh, criminal justice reform that uh, Donald uh, Trump put in place. Uh, if Vivek says he will repeal Juneteenth as a holiday. So when these people are running to the right of Donald Trump, running to the right of Mussolini, uh, running to the right of many fascist dictators around the world, believe them when they say it to you. They are not joking. This is, this is them being moderate, what they're saying out loud. This is the compromise position that they say on the campaign trail. So when they, if they ever get into the office, they will be going far further to the right than this in a way that will be dangerous to all of us. And I think people have to understand that right now when you're looking at programs like this, the same way that after the war you had so many people down in Argentina talking about, well, I was just uh, following orders, uh, it wasn't really me. That's the same the way these people are going to act who helped Ron DeSantis during this process of trying to resegregate Florida. I need everybody hearing the sound of my voice to understand what I'm telling y'all right now. Why did I write my book, Why Fear? Because it comes down to the money. It comes down to black progress. Y'all, there's no... You, ha, you literally have white men like Ed Bloom suing this fund in Atlanta. Right now, y'all, black people, not black women, not black men, black people, period, get less than 2% of all venture capital fund, funds in America. And they sue in this group because they want to target black women-led businesses. We get less than 2%. They like, man, that damn 2%, that 2% is just too much. Oh, that 2% is just too much. We can't have that. Again, I need y'all to hear what I'm saying. On a federal level, black people are getting 1.67% of all federal contracts. $560 billion annually in federal contracts, black businesses get 1.67%. And they saying, ooh, them Negroes getting way too much money. I need y'all to understand, this is what they're saying. And they keep saying, oh, what's fair, what's fair. And again, but y'all notice, see again, so remember when, when, when Deanna Bass was here and I was talking about, oh, you're calling yourself pro-life? No, you're really anti-abortion? So when they say equal, we are equal, well then let's show equal in other areas. So you can't deprive us of health resources, education resources, economic resources, and then go, oh no, we're all equal, we're all the same. What you are witnessing, y'all, I'm telling you, and a bunch of black people are walking around dazed and confused, and there are Negroes like Gil, Glenn Gilzine who are like, I'm a superior Negro, so the rest of you uh, should, should be doing better. Well, Glenn, there's a whole bunch of us who are smart, who are talented, but we also understand that the magical Negro doesn't exist. And there, were, there, were, there, there was that one black person post-slavery, and that was that one black person doing Jim Crow who white folks love to prop, prop up. And guess what? A lot of us were still getting screwed. All of y'all watching, when y'all, I'm trying to explain to y'all voting and how the dots are connected, understand what's going on here. Right now, in Virginia, there are elections in November. All seats in Virginia. Democrats are three seats away from controlling the House. They control the Senate by one seat. Oh, Republican Glenn Youngkin is the governor, but Louise Lucas controls the Senate. If Democrats take control of the House, Don Scott becomes the House Majority Leader. Lucas is black, Scott is black. Now, here's where some of y'all right there just got lost. Because I see some of y'all, man, some fool in here talking about, we need to separate. Where your ass going? <laughs> you can't even move to the country and escape white folk. The thing I need people to understand is this here. And again, this is when y'all got to stop listening to stupid people who get stuck on stupid by saying, oh, here you go, saying we should vote for the Democrats. 
is two parties, Republican, Democratic Party. Which of the two parties are you likely going to get what's on the black agenda? It's only two. All y'all hollering third party, that shit cute. It's cute, but it ain't gonna happen. I'm just trying to tell y'all, it ain't gonna happen. It's cute. And I'm not saying ignore the Republicans. I dare any Republican candidate to come sit with black people and say your agenda. But this is what I want to know, Robert. This is what I want to know, Rebecca. This is what I want to know, Scott. If any Republican that comes to sit before black people, I want black people to ask them a series of questions. First, do you support expansion of voting rights or do you support the current effort of the Republican Party to constrict voting rights? That's number one. Number two, do you support ballot drop boxes or are you against it? Do you support the expansion of polling locations or are you against it? I want to hear those questions asked first. I want to hear questions asked specifically about the growth of black businesses. I want to hear questions specifically about resources being added specifically for the children who are most in need educationally. I didn't say black kids. I said, check the data. Where is the greatest need? Are you willing to put more resources into those areas? I want, because see, if y'all read Randall Robinson's book, The Debt, he talked about this here where Maynard Jackson said, we need to come up with uh, basically the black agenda and put it on a card that can fit in everybody's wallet. So anytime a politician came, we could say, do you support this, 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 this? And see what they say. So again, I'm not saying don't consider Republican. What I am saying is ask them a series of questions that goes beyond your personal pocketbook. I can tell you right now, when you ask those questions, it ain't gonna go well for Republicans. <clears throat> now, the Democratic candidate may not agree with you on all your issues, but Scott, Rebecca, Robert, if I'm setting, if I'm asking a series of questions and I got 10 issues, and the Republican agrees with me on one out of 10, and the Democrat agrees with me on five out of 10, I am not going to say they are equal because the math just don't math. And that right there, Rebecca, I think is the problem when people say, oh, both the lesser of two evils, this real simple. If I got 10 asked, one says I'm down with one, one says I'm down with five. Common sense says I should go with the person who down with me on five, because five is better than one. And I, must, I can push the five to get to 10, but it's a long ass haul to get to one, to get to five, much less 10. <laughs> You know, my, uh, you know, Roland. That's that decision calculus is also is a decision calculus based upon survival. I also, as a community, understand that the black community is not a monolith. We make up many different communities. We have different stories and different journeys with how we got to this country. Uh, something else that we have to think about beyond survival is how do we thrive? How do we go from surviving to thriving? And so we also need to figure out which party, which group, which politician is going to cut a deal with us. Because bottom line, we need to we need to we need to survive as a community, but we also need to thrive as a community. We need to um, increase um, a black wealth in this country instead of being severely outpaced by white folks in this country. We need to decrease the pay equity gap in this country. We need to make sure that black entrepreneurs have access to capital. We need to make sure that our black kids. Um, actually have quality education. We know the majority of public school students are students of color, and there's a lot of black students. And then we see in states like Arkansas, 
states like Florida, these public schools no longer want to teach black history. So we also need to be cutting a deal and demand the best education that our black kids can receive. So there's a lot of things. It's great if Democrats want to give us five out of 10. It's horrible if Republicans only want to give us one out of 10. But bottom line, I even want to go higher. because so I think that's the baseline for votes. But if you actually want us to get out and support, then we need to know who's going to cut a deal with us, a deal that has generational impact and not just impact on the next election. All I'm trying to get the people to understand, uh, uh, Scott, is elections have consequences. And what I'm not interested about, I'm not interested in you bitching after the fact if you were never in the game when you could have made a difference. Exactly. I'd add to that list in regard to that card you talked about, um, I'd add values, right? Who shares my values or the values of black America? Because what you don't want to do is say, just vote straight Democrat or vote for black Democrats, because there's some black Democrats out here who don't share our values, don't agree with that list, right? And so I don't put the race question into who I vote for. I make it a value question. If you share my values and you aren't black, you're brown, you're white, you're yellow, you're red, then that's who I want to support. Because I know even if it's five out of 10, if, I, if he shares or she shares my values, then I got a shot at the other five, quite frankly. At least that's my process for thinking. But I don't know why we can't get black people to vote. As you say, vote more, not that they don't vote. I still say vote. I'll add vote more. But why we? Why is it so hard for black people to vote up and down the ballot, to vote in every election? It's such an easy thing to do, and yet we just don't do it. And that's why we're in this third reconstruction, as you say often, and why we are suffering. I mean, I often say in 2043, we're going to be a country of color. That's incredible fact for us, but is black America ready to lead and to be a country of color and to lead this democracy, this 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 experiment of ours, right. which we will be in control of from a voting standpoint? And I fear not, or I fear that from the socioeconomic and health care disparity standpoint, not only are we not ready, but more importantly, we don't have a consciousness about leading and voting and what that means for our communities of color. That's where the work needs to be done between now and 2043, in my opinion. Here's the whole deal, Robert. Uh, and, and I think, and, and again, I see these people, uh, they run little miles in, in the chat room talking about, oh, oh, you know what? You don't support this. You don't support that. Look, it's real simple. And again, and I'm going to say this again to anybody who keeps, keeps yelling reparations. You can't get reparations from policy makers unless you change the politicians who are setting the policy. Yes. So if your simple ass ain't voting, you are guaranteed never to get it. It's like 100% guarantee. So it's, it's like, Robert, the dumbass who said, I ain't voting for the president because the electoral college, that's who they picked the president so until they change the Electoral College, I ain't voting. Dumbass, the Electoral College is in the Constitution. You got to vote to change the Constitution. And the vote comes in the House and the Senate signed by the president, then it's ratified by the states. So guess what? Your simple ass ain't going to never change the Electoral College because your dumbass don't vote for the people who could change the law of the Electoral College. That's how stupid some of these people are, Robert. Uh, uh, Roll. I, I need you to uh, get on some edibles real quick. You gotta calm that down. You, <laughs> woo, no, that shit ain't never happened stop. right there. Hell no. Yeah, I want to be in full control take, take of all of my faculties. Uh, uh, 
So just, just some nice sativa. <laughs> just calm it down just a little bit. But but look, Roland, I, I've found that in the last few years, for some reason, uh, conservatives have started taking famous quotes from civil rights leaders uh, and then perverting them to their own uh, their own causes. First, we saw them uh, take the quote unquote "I have a dream" speech and then just kind of narrow it down to the, the content of their character, not the cover of the color of their skin. And then I started seeing Mike Huckabee and other conservatives use that to justify taking away diversity, equity, and inclusion programs. Uh, Ron DeSantis is using that quote to justify getting rid of affirmative, uh, getting in front of affirmative action and taking away CRT, as he calls it, programs. Now the new one that we've seen black conservatives using is they take a quote from Malcolm X where he says, uh, you put Democrats first and they put you la last because you're political chumps. And they take that one little bite out and use that as a justification for saying why uh, black folks don't need to be going for the Democratic Party. You can, re you can just literally rewind that clip about 45 seconds. And what Malcolm is actually saying is that any group that can use their vote in a block, any group that's able to put together their votes in, and is able to be that swing uh, vote in any election has tremendous political power. He talks about the fact that in 1960, the election was basically tied. He said it was tied so much they had to go to a recount, then it got counted over again after that. And if we hold our votes and make sure that we're using it as a block to negotiate between both parties, then we have the opportunity to make real changes. Right now, the only party that's negotiating Negotiating with us is the Democratic Party. I would love it if the Republican Party would come over and start negotiating with us. I want Republicans to start saying, I'm a 1865 Republican. Say, I'm a radical Reconstructionist Republican. Campaign on the same platform that Senator Stevens campaigned on back in the 1864 election. Start talking about Sherman's field order number 15 and what you're going to do for, the, uh, for African Americans. It's not as if they, as a grand old party, they didn't used to hold these ideas. But instead of talking about that, you only hear about these broad neoconservative social warfare uh, terms that they want to fight these elections over. And unfortunately, there's a lot of folks in our community that fall into the culture war arguments. You're anti-immigrant, so therefore you uh, you say you want to vote uh, Republican. You're anti-woman, and you want to restore the good old nuclear family where women were in the kitchen cooking uh, dinner three uh, five nights a week, and therefore you vote Republican. You don't like gay people, and your daughter just came out as being non-binary. So now you want to. Uh, you want to vote and support Ron DeSantis, get over the culture war and vote in your own interest. And unless Republicans are willing to be 1865 Republicans, they don't really have anything to say right now because the 2023 version appears to be very similar to the 1919 version when uh, Woodrow Wilson was in the White House. I'm going to close this out with this. I got some fool on Instagram, I mean on YouTube, saying Vitaman, 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 V-I-T-A-M-A-N. Wrong, rolling, wrong. Uh, if they know you're going to vote for them anyway, do you think they're going to give you what you want? Let me tell you how stupid you are. This ain't going to take long. Chris Spencer up next. This ain't going to take long at all. First of all, you simple Simon ass. There's a process that's called the primary and the general. Okay? So you can vote for who you desire in the primary. Now, if there's a Democrat who is not doing what the community wants, we can vote that person out in the primary and vote our person in and then vote for them again in the general. So there's a way to hold people accountable who are not doing what the community desires. We see it all the time. There are people who are challenged in primaries all the time and they lose. That's what the whole system is. So that's just stupid. The last point is this here, and y'all heard me say this. Elections are in of one process and the beginning of another. So when the election is over, then we gotta be on their ass. It's writing letters, calling, emailing, because you have to now pressure them to do what's right. You got to show up at their town hall meetings. You got to be in their face, because guess who does that? the other side, the other folk who disagree with you, too many of us check out of the process. And I know this because my mama and daddy were involved in a civic club growing up. I participated as a kid traveling to Austin, Texas on a bus with the Metropolitan Organization and my mama when they had rallies on the weekends. I spoke before the city council when I was in the 10th grade. I saw with my own eyes how regular, ordinary people, folk who didn't go to college, who didn't have college degrees, 
My mom and daddy combined ain't never made more than $50,000 combined in their whole life. So don't try to say, well, you probably came from, hell no, I ain't come from no damn money at all. But what I saw were people who gave a shit about their families and gave a damn about their neighborhood and were willing to be involved politically. And so, yeah, I was eight and nine and 10 handing shit out at the polls on election day because mama and daddy were involved. They ran phone banks and were involved in campaigns. So when I'm telling y'all what we have to do, I'm not sitting here speaking from some, from, from some theoretical 30,000 feet high ass position. I'm telling you what I have experienced my entire life from when I was seven, eight, nine, ten 10 years old. Saw it with my own eyes. And so when we say our communities are not changing, it's also because too many of us have given up and we have checked out and we are waiting on somebody else to be the savior to come save us. And what we should do is abide by what MLK said on April 3rd, 1968, that when black people move as a collective, then collectively we can get things changed. You better start because I'm telling y'all, we on the clock and what the Republicans have in store for black people, if they control the Senate next year and if they control the House and they control the White House, I can guarantee you, if you pissed off now what's happening in Florida, you're going to be real pissed because they're going to try to put this stuff in place across the whole country. We'll be right back. You go into a barber shop in a in a in a 700 credit score neighborhood, black or white. They're talking about their ideas and, and they're talking about how they're going to move on those things. You go to a barber shop at a 500 credit score, equal brilliance but bad culture. They're talking about other people. You go to a winners winners barber shop. Here's what I'm doing. You go to the barber shop of the where people feel defeated. They talk about other people, either celebrities or or. or or people they admire, but also often, I don't like Joe. I don't like, you know, I don't like Roland Martin. Well, let me tell you something. I don't understand people. Why, how would you not like anything here you see? You should just be like, this is amazing. It's cool. You may not even like how he does it or how I do it, but it's like, you know what? They're succeeding. They're killing it. All you should be is, that's fan. Fantastic. But if I don't like me, I'm not going to like you. If I don't feel good about me, it's hard for me to feel good about you. If I don't respect me, don't expect me to respect you. If I don't love me, I don't have a clue how to love you. And here's the big one. If I don't have a purpose in my life, I'm going to make your life right. a living hell. from LA and this is the culture. The culture is a two-way conversation. You and me, we talk about the stories, politics, the good, the bad, and the downright ugly. So join our community every day at 3 p.m. Eastern and let your voice be heard. Hey, we're all in this together, so let's talk about it and see what kind of trouble we can get into. It's the culture, weekdays at 3, only on the Black Star Network. Hi, everybody, I'm Kim Coles. Hey, I'm Dolly Simpson. Yo, it's your man Deion Cole from Blackish, and you're watching Roland Martin Unfiltered. All right, folks, a new movie drops on Friday. It is called Back on the Strip. Uh, and it is directed by uh, a reformed stripper, Chris Spencer. Uh, he's a comedian, he's a writer, uh, he's an actor, uh, and so uh, he, the new movie comes out. Man, stop adjusting the damn camera. You're bouncing over there. Look at you, like your head bobbing. Uh, your, people yelling, your people are yelling at me to move. I'm sorry. Uh, uh, yeah, I mean, look, we done had you connected for the last 20 minutes. I mean, you got that... Uh, uh, that listen, hearing you rant, I'm like, you should run for president. Oh, hell no, it's a pay cut. Uh, so... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> New movie's called. Got, at least you ain't got to show your taxes. <laughs> New movie's called Back on the Strip. Uh, here's a preview. 
You're all set. You guys are going on last because you had the best audition. You must be talking about us. Ghetto gangsters in the house. Ooh. We ain't just rappers. We gangsters. We come from the streets. Uh, Beverly Hills. Sit your down somewhere. Ladies, I'm going to give you what you've all been waiting for. Are you out of your gut mind? Excuse me, Lord. Oh, you got to me. Those are <laughs> ran at my highest bar tab in weeks. Sometimes you just want to get wild. All I asked was to hang with my girls. It's time to hang with the guys. Go ahead, let's hear it. We're in a thing. Stripper brushing her hair? That's my kind of trick! Woo! Bumping and grinding! Push it! Push it! What the hell? It smells like now ladies and hood rat push. Push it real good! How did I not know this dude was white? Doc is out. Why am I out? I loved being black. Being white is so boring. You ever try to stay awake, watch an episode of The Crown? Those ladies were way more handsy than even in our day. They got me pacing back and forth, talking to the Lord right now. <laughs> you ready for round two? Stop crying! Stop crying! All right, Chris Spencer joins us now. Chris, glad to have you here. Thank you, sir. Um, uh, you know, gives my better judgment. We'll see. Because we, you, it was a drop you recorded, uh, and you actually had the nerd question. So that's why I wore my alpha shirt today, because you said something. Y'all find that drop when Chris was talking some trash uh, about uh, me being an alpha, and then got my age completely wrong. Because, I mean, I know you pushing 70, uh, but it's all good. So I got your age wrong? You got all of that. Yeah, you, yeah. You. Now, now, we're going to play it for you, because uh, cause I, I meant to text you about it, uh, but then I said, well, when I get him on the show, I'm going to ask him about it. It's all good, though. So let's talk about back on the strip. Yes, sir. Who let you direct? Uh, <laughs> society. <laughs> Uh, this uh, independent company called GVN, uh, a good friend of mine, uh, not a good friend of mine, he's a good friend of mine now, uh, Gino Taylor, uh, read the script, noticed my talents, and uh, my, the script was actually written by myself and my writing partner, Eric Daniel, and they're like, who's going to direct this fantastic script? And my writing partner was like, Chris. And I was like, yep. <laughs> and that's kind of how it happened. So you directed and you wrote it as well? As, and produced it. And produced along with it. My wife. Oh, oh, my so, wife oh, also oh, oh so you, you trying to be Tyler Perry? Something like that. A Wayans, minimum a Wayans. <laughs> <laughs> well, 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 plus if they go ahead and uh, you know if you if you do all of that, uh, that means uh, they can say we, we can pay you less. You get one check. Maybe, maybe I should break up for <laughs> money purposes. <laughs> yeah, uh, you should be getting three separate checks. Uh, yeah. And he said, uh, he said uh, you produce it with your wife. Yes. Yes, uh, producer of my wife, who was basically the glue throughout this whole project because, you know, as an independent and, you know, a lot of things happen, you know what I mean? And so she was right there. Uh, I don't even want to, I guess I could say sometimes in front of me, sometimes we say they're by, their, we're by, they're by your side. She was in front of me and I was like, please help. And so uh, her expertise in the business, along with this incredible crew and cast of other people, uh, made for an incredible ride, and I hope you guys enjoy it. So, were the times when she was like, uh, uh, Chris, let me holler at you? Yeah. And, and you were over there going, uh huh, uh huh. Because so, you know what? Sometimes you need that person to go, remember the dude I told you I don't trust? <laughs> He's do, he doing something right now. I'm like, thanks, babe. I always got my back. <laughs> Remember I told you what? Oh, well, he, he's doing some extra right now. Now, typically when you when you're doing something on your own, first time director, you had to call in some favors. Uh, yes. And so when it came to casting, uh, did you have to sit here and say, "All right, some of y'all owe me, so bring your ass to the movie"? Not at all. As a matter of fact, most of them actually said yes before they even read the script. I told them the concept. And they were like, yo, this is something I want to do. I love to work with you. Yes, yes, yes. I mean, 
JB Smooth, of course, you know from Real Husbands of Hollywood, as long as 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 well as Faison and Tiffany, we've been knowing each other forever. Uh, JB and Gary, I mean Gary and Bill, I've known them 25, almost 30 years, and uh, Tiffany, I've known since she was 15 years old. So a lot of those were no-brainers that we would all work together again. Wesley was the one, although I've known him, you know, actually the producers brought him to the table. Really? And, yeah, it, it was great. They, had, they already had a relationship. They had done films before. Wesley, of course, I've known for years. And they told him about the project. And he actually said yes before reading the script. Now, the problem is when you know us, so many people, everybody can't be in. So yeah. did, did you have to deal with some folks who like, say, Chris, what's up? Bro, couldn't get a call. Uh, you Till could today. <laughs> and sometimes I've had, you know, Okay, of course, they all know about your 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 tongue. I too have a sharp tongue, so many of them was like, "Yo, why you ain't put me in the movie?" I was like, "Why ain't nobody put you in any movie?" <laughs> <laughs> but that's just only after they badgered me so much. But I'm like, "Listen, this is my first of hopefully many. So hopefully, I will be in uh, a seat where I'll have a bigger budget and I can have a different cast, and you can be a part of it." But right now, these are the guys that fit this role. There was nothing for you in this project. Gotcha. See, well, see you, you were nice about it. Cause I, yeah. Because I didn't. <laughs> A couple of them I had to go, well, you, you know you're not good. <laughs> look, <laughs> you, know, I, you, should, you should really go back to school. <laughs> <laughs> look, sometimes you got to be honest with people. Uh, let's see here. Questions uh, from my panel. Uh, let's see who I think probably is the most ignorant one. Well, the most ignorant one on the panel is Scott, uh, but probably the most ignorant uh, one uh, with humor. Uh, if, if you, I'm going to tell you right now, Chris, if you ever need somebody in a movie uh, who is a gun nut aficionado, feel free to call Robert Patillo. You do not need to call uh, the prop department because he got everything from a 22 to a bazooka. His, I, I guarantee, wait, wait, that, Chris, that I, Alec Baldwin. that's not Alec Baldwin's guy, is it? No, I, get, I guarantee you, I guarantee you, <laughs> Robert got an AK-47 sitting <laughs> under his chair right now. Assault rifle. Why, 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 do you, why do you think I just have random AR-15s around just sitting places? Because your I, ass do. It, you right, boom, hey, watch, watch this, Chris. Watch this, Chris. Watch this, Chris. Damn! <laughs> it's Robert's panic room. He does this every Look. week. Look at that shit, bro. Look at that. That's crazy. Oh, oh my God. God. <laughs> Look, we're in Georgia. Listen, the, listen the, if you the, got that many guns, it's time to move. Come any day. Say it again, so, Chris. Say I, it again, Chris. If you got that many guns, it's time to move. <laughs> no, no, hey, he, hey, he, he in Georgia, Chris. Oh. The whole point, the whole point of being in Georgia is to be able to have our wonderful governor uh, to pass these nice laws. So if the MAGA start acting up after Trump goes to jail, uh, everybody will be ready and prepared just in case. But, but I did have a question about, uh, one, does J.B. Smooth have a deal with the devil? How is he in everything at all times? He's Caesar. He's uh, doing every movie, every TV show. He seems to just be in the background everywhere on Earth. Because he's so good. You know what I mean? There was a time when people were saying the same thing about Sam Jackson and, of course, Kevin Hart. When you're good, you're wanted, and people, they want you, and uh, you're needed, and your talent, you know, is usually uh, what they're dying to expose and actually enhance their projects. And that's what I'm doing. Absolutely. And I just love the fact you were able to bring all these artists together. How did you get all these, one, egos, but two, schedules to line up to get this much talent into this movie? The Eagles were no problem because we've known each other for over 30, 25, 30 years. So we know who ain't shit and we know who's, who is shit and we know who to respect. We know who to res We all respect each other. We love each other. Comedy, we're a big fraternity and we all respect each other and love each other. In terms of schedules, that was rough. I must admit, but my wife who was also the casting director uh, along with the line producer. Um, they, had a, they had, and the first AD, they had a tough time trying to, uh, you know, because all of them, all of them are stand up. So they made a lot of money uh, or missed out on a lot of money from gigs they had to turn down to do the movie. Now, y'all shot the movie in Vegas? Yes, in Vegas. It was and, 100 and a million degrees. And, and how, uh, over how many days? 20 days. 20 days. Got it. Rebecca. 
Chris, thank you so much for being on tonight. Um, you spent many years um, being a screenwriter. And uh, oftentimes on the show, we talk about pay equity. So in light of the WGA striking, what does pay equity look like for black screenwriters in Hollywood? Hmm. What is the exact definition of pay equity? You well, you define it. Okay. So right now we're not being treated fairly. Um, and let me give an example. I have a show called Real Husbands of Hollywood. It aired first on BET. It now can be seen on Amazon, Netflix, uh, Hulu, and a, f a few other streamers. Have I gotten another check for that? No. So that's why we're out there striking, because there's some things that are going on that are unfair. So you got paid when it aired originally, but yes. when it gets resold to the other streamers, you don't get any residuals? I have not yet. Mm. Isn't that crazy? That is crazy. Yeah. yeah. Now, and, and listen, there was a point where I understood, like, okay, it's under the Viacom umbrella. So when it was on MTV and Comedy Central, I heard, yeah, you're probably not going to get any money because it's under this umbrella. But when it started going to these other places, that's when I started to go, something's wrong. And something is very unfair. Because how are people pay paying a premium price for the show that I did over here and I'm not getting anything from it? And that's a lot of why uh, we are striking. All right. Scott. Hey, Chris. Congratulations on the movie. Scott Bolton here. We met Thank with you, the Turk and Steve Capers. We're great friends with them. Man, and, that's the um, damn question. Oh, will you leave me alone? Will you I had set the stage. Oh, I met you here. You know, I met you there. We took a photo. We were at Martha's oh, Beans together. That's where we met, actually. Just... <laughs> exactly. Stop it, Roland. Damn. So, your direct, you got your di di directorial <laughs> debut. I knew you were, were writing, but on the stand-up comedian space, are you still going to do stand-up, or are you going to focus on writing fact, and, and directing? Absolutely. As a matter of fact, I just shot my comedy special called Yellow Belt, uh, yeah. which is actually, and we're in the process of right now figuring out who's going to give me the best deal. But of course, this strike, this, this strike has slowed everything down. But um, yeah, no, no, stand up is number one. That is my first love. Yeah. Are you all going to bring the Influencers Brunch back to DC for CBC Absolutely. weekend? We Absolutely. haven't done it in yeah. a couple of years. Yeah, Turk Stevens and I, yeah, we, we plan on taking it all over the country, if not the world. It's It's been very, very successful in Los Angeles. Yeah, it was a lot of fun. And you, a lot of and fun. You do, and you do remember how well we did in the D.C. area, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. So absolutely. Um, uh, have, have you decided that one thing you're not going to do again, uh, that is host your own show, or do, or do you want uh, a second bite at the apple? I, de I definitely would love a second bite at the apple. Um, and for those who don't know... Uh, Chris, uh, what, what, what was the show Vibe? Is that what it was? Yes, sir. Guy, how long did that show last? Um, uh, it was long enough to go v <laughs> and, instead of Vibe. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, you, you, <laughs> you remember, I did, I did 11 weeks, which is roughly 55 shows, and then Sinbad came and took it over. Ah, got it, got it. Now, people, I mean, again, though, so, again, it's one, like, for a long time, people kind of like, oh, my God, Chris Prince was an awful show host. Uh, but, 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 again, though, it's, what people don't understand is it's a different animal when you actually, go... When you, go back and watch, and you'll go, he was actually pretty good. What I was bad at, Roland, was the monologue, because you and I are storytellers, and also, although we tell jokes, it's hard to read a joke. Jay Leno... You know, guys who are straight monologists, <laughs> and you know they—that was in their their rhythm. My rhythm is as more of a shit talker, and so as I started to become better at reading the prompter and making it my own, I got fired. But it also go, but it also goes to uh, what I'll say. It goes to the problem is when you have a formula how it should be done, uh, yes. and I think that is always the mistake. Uh, that people make, and they, they don't want it. They don't want to get out of that rigid system. Yes, uh, I mean, it's it sort of like uh, I mean, I had uh, I had somebody in the studio. They were kind of like, so you don't really read the you don't really read the prompter, do you? I'm like, nah, that's a guide. I'm like, so I don't if I don't want to, I don't have to. 
And, and I remember when I beat at CNN, that was the original vision. I called it a scripted, unscripted show. And my deal is, get out of, it has to be this way. I'm like, let stuff, if stuff flow, let it flow. And that's the right. problem. And so, you know, again, and look, that, that was a long time ago when you hosted the show. And that's one of the problems. I think now it's not as rigid. And so mm -hmm. people are, uh, it's about a lot, a lot more free flowing. And I think it, that, that helps. But that's always part of the problem when there's a rigid system. Like uh, imagine, imagine if Allen Iverson had to play for, for, for uh, Bobby Knight. You know what I mean? Yeah, that wasn't gonna work out. It's not gonna work out. Well, hell, I remember. Look, David Edwards, God rest his soul, when he played for Georgetown, uh, John Thompson told him, "Do not dribble, do not dribble between your legs." And that was his thing. Yeah. I, he came to play ball at Texas A&M, but that was his thing. So some cats are like that. So it's always a matter of flowing. Uh, last exactly. question: When you did this movie here, obviously. I, obviously, when you are a writer, you want folks to pay attention. Uh, you also are directing, so you can't waste time because time is money. How much freedom did you give your folk to free flow when they saw the opportunity? Well, I learned this from Keenan Ivory Wayans. Um, he would say, listen, give me the first take as written. Got it. And then play. And you got to imagine, I have Bill Bellamy, Faison, Gary Owen, Tiffany... JB Smooth, they're all improv magicians. So many times I was like, yo, you could just go on the first take. Especially <laughs> now that we have 20 days and we gotta get the hell out of here. And then Wesley Snipes, you know, it was just like we were all in awe of basically working with the GOAT. But what was great about him was he actually looked up to us too. You know what I mean? Like you know, he knew the set. He knew all the, although we knew him, but it was mostly in the clubs or you know in the gym. But he actually, you know, he watches TV too. He enjoys comedy too. He's seen everybody's comedy specials. He watched Def Jam, Comic View. He's seen us on sitcoms, sitcoms. So when we were like Wesley, he'd be like, "Yo, that thing you did on blah blah blah. Yo, I love that." And we like. Wesley knows me. Oh, yeah. No, people are real. I mean, he watches this show. I sent him a text uh, for his birthday. Yeah. Uh, and again, you like, damn, you like recounting segments. And so you sort of you sort of forget that. Guess what? Other folk watch, too. And so we love, we love seeing each other. As bad as people talk about Tubi, we be watching Tubi. <laughs> <laughs> or you wouldn't be able to quote it. <laughs> good point. Good point. All right. So they found a drop. Well, you were talking a little trash. I don't even know where they shot this. Go ahead and roll it. Damn place, okay? Okay, hold on, guys. Sorry, y'all. The audio was low. Come on. Restart it. Let's have the audio full up. Full up. Let's go. When you are now. Come on. Get the audio full up. You ain't got to wear black and gold every damn place, okay? Ooh, I'm an alpha. Yay. All right. You're 58 years old. It's over. Then you are now watching. All right. Mark. That's what Listen. you're looking now, how funny would it have been if I would have said you're 48? No, 50. Well, first, well, first of all, that's factually incorrect because I'm 54. Yeah, so. but guess what? I shot that six years ago. Huh? <laughs> yes, <laughs> yes. Uh, and so, I and know I, you're and younger I, than me. I know you. Well, you're younger than me. And I figured it I was. was called a, it was called a joke. And I figured I'd see you as said, uh, uh, you're gonna be in Cabo. Yes, sir. Gotcha. And so, just do understand. Uh, it's gonna be all black and gold. So I mean, I was gonna do something else, but I said Chris gonna be there, so it's gonna be the black and gold golf bag, the outfit, all that. There you go. All that. Yeah, listen, listen. Nobody can say that you don't come out stylish. <laughs> now they might not like your style, but you still be stylish. And I don't give a damn. <laughs> you have not yet to give a damn. I have never I'm given a damn. You ain't got no kick. You ain't got no kente cloth or some royal regal Ugandan wear and made into some golf clothes. Um, hold my beer. Yeah, <laughs> I'm sure you do. So I'm gonna I'm have to I'm gonna have to break that out for you uh, ne next time. Uh, oh, you do have some. okay. Oh yeah, let's break out. Oh, first of all, you know, look, my fans send me all kind of stuff, so uh, I know somebody right now is working on a kente uh, uh, pattern golf bag. It's happening. Ooh, okay. It's happening. You know it's happening. All right. Need, we need two. Oh, 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 now we need two. Okay, gotcha. All right. Uh, yeah. Folks, the movie's called Back on the Strip. Uh, it hits theaters on Friday. Um, August 18th. August 18th. Go, uh, go big or go home. That's our moniker. Y'all know how important it is the first weekend. Uh, I'm going to be in L.A. tomorrow because uh, I'm going to play golf Friday with Darius Rucker. 
and I'm gonna go to his concert. So I may go check it out on Saturday. So uh, may, may have. So are you are you gonna no, you gonna do what some people do? You gonna be theater hopping? Yes, sir. We're gonna actually buy out the theater in Inglewood or somewhere. At uh, I believe it's Inglewood or the, in the, the old Magic Johnson. And then I'm going to go boom, 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 and just hear and wave at folks and shake hands. And no, wave. no, no, no. I'm, I'm, I'm going to a movie theater where white people are, because so, I want to actually hear the follow-up joke. Because, see, with black people, when you go to a comedy, you cannot go see a movie with a whole bunch of black people, because you literally are going to miss the joke or the dialogue after the joke, and you gotta, right. you, gotta, you gotta see it twice. But as a comedic writer, that's what I wanna hear this time. I didn't heard the joke. I wanna hear them talk to the screen. <laughs> well, I don't sit next to them. Shut your ass up. I'm trying to hit a damn movie. I do hate people who talk during movies. It jocks me. You ever, you ever call, <laughs> you ever get mad at somebody talking shit, talking at the movie screen and then find yourself doing it? Will you shut up? <laughs> no, I'm, no, no, I'll do that. No, I, I'm going to tell you how crazy I am. I don't know if Scott has done this here. Robert, he probably point guns at people. Uh, but <laughs> but when, our fa when our family gets together, I hate watching movies with the rest of my family. And they watch it right now, and they all know. I remember when Barbershop came out. You know them, you know them big old spotlights that you keep yep. in your car uh, when your car breaks down? Mm -hmm. Anytime somebody in the family talk, I would hit the ass with the spotlight. Uh, yes. and, and it was one of them like really bright lights. I probably hit my mama by six, eight. I was like, mama, stop talking. I'm telling you, I can't. So dude, I leave the room. Dude, I, I can't stand, I like y'all talk too damn much. <laughs> they talk too much. Who, it, uh, Scott, Robert, Rebecca, y'all ain't got no family members who talk. They talk too damn much. And then it's like, what happened? Cause you were talking, that's why you asking what happened. No. Hey, bro, you know what I do? If you're at home watching it, I just keep rewinding it back. No. Nope. Hell back. no. Just no. Off. Hell no. We got to do that for my daddy because he'll fall asleep. He'll come back. I'm like, hey. <laughs> <laughs> when, 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 rewind, when rewind. Hey, dog, y'all don't want to say. I got so. Y'all don't want to say. I got so frustrated. I said, fuck it. I went to the other room and said, look, I ain't watching nothing with y'all. That's funny. I'm do. I can't. <laughs> Look, Roland, Roland, I have advice. Look, look, Roland, just a piece of advice for married men. Whenever you're watching a series with your wife, just make sure you pre-watch every episode that comes out, then re-watch it with her as it's the first time you've ever seen it. Because you have to stop every three minutes to you know, talk about what just happened, or now she's seen something, exactly. or there's usually a side quest or a side story somewhere hey. in there and out. Hey, pre-watch hey, everything. It makes life easier. Hey, Robert, let me explain something to you. We don't watch the same damn shows. <laughs> Okay, just, see, we done already saw that problem. Two, two, I got seven viewing stations in my house. So we ain't gotta watch no TV together. You can watch over there, there, third floor, second floor, first floor, I'm good. Now we ain't doing all that. We ain't doing all that. There's not one show that's y'all watch close. together? Hell no. She be watching all them, them SIs, CSIs, NCISs, all them damn shows. She's like, I don't like your shows. I don't like your shows. Perfect. Holla at you later. See, see, Rolly, this is where you're supposed to say, we watch the Black Star Network together every night. Get, hey, see, see, right there, just slide that in there. Hey, guess what? We don't watch the Black Star Network together because I'm actually working. <laughs> <laughs> we ain't doing it. So, no. So, yeah, I don't know. See, Chris, you better see you and your wife work on a movie together. Yeah, that couldn't happen. That couldn't happen. Listen, it, it just came to fruition after, you know, we started doing our, uh, we had a podcast called Date Night. Oh, I remember. And, yeah. Oh, yeah, you guys were on. And I was like, yo, I actually like you. Wait a minute. Y'all got to say, we did the podcast. I was saying some stuff. Chris' wife was like, don't your ass listen to him. <laughs> she was like, mm -mm, do not listen. And Chris was sitting there like, how in the hell is he getting away with all this? It's like, uh, -uh totally different. That's it. All right. Listen, I got to go, Chris. Um, Appreciate I mean, you, man. Good luck. We're back on the strip. Uh, and, man, and next time, don't be having, don't be telling me my people reached out. To buy. So, but this, I'm just going to leave y'all with this here, Scott, Robert. Uh, well, hold on. Hold on a second. Because many times things get uh, fall through the cracks. So if they can keep the schedule right, then... I don't have to worry about, oh, shit, I should have, oh, you know what I mean? No, 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 I understand. So let me tell you what happened. So yesterday, I'm talking to Payne Brown, and Payne Brown says, hey, Roland, by the way, do you know Chris Spence? I'm like, yeah, I know his ass. 
Uh, he's like, hey, he got a movie coming out. Uh, it'd be great to get him on the show. I'm like, uh, I text his ass on some other bullshit all the time. He ain't say nothing about, yo, let me come on and discuss the movie. Now listen. And, and so and then, then and then he put he, this week, so Payne sent a group text. Me and Chris, I was like, yeah, you can come on tomorrow. And he's like, oh yeah, uh, my people uh, was supposed to be handled. I was like, did his ass just hit me with my people? Sorry, sorry. Sorry. I was like, yeah, he'll come on. I said, but I'm going to go ahead and let him know. I said, next time, just text the brother. Here's what's crazy. If there's an audience that's tailor-made for this damn movie, it's yours. So that won't happen again when I do Back on the Strip 2. <laughs> All right. Again, <laughs> folks, watch Back on the Strip. Hits the theaters on Friday. Chris Prince, I appreciate it, bro. Thanks a lot. I appreciate you, man. Thank you. And bye, everybody else on the panel. Scott, Rebecca, Robert, I appreciate y'all being on the panel. Thanks so much. I saw some photos of Scott of your ass on Martha's Vineyard with your little cappers. So, uh, you know, whatever. I mean, I, I well, can say that. grown ass man, baby, and we were looking good. I actually, looking yeah, actually, good. I was looking a little raggedy. Uh, just letting y'all know. So, <laughs> just y'all were looking a little raggedy. So, you know, but you're not, but you're not alphas, and so look, you can't be that great. All right, y'all. I'm past eight p.m. We need to go. Uh, first of all, uh, first of all, uh, stop talking, C. I ain't cussed you out all. I ain't cussed you out about three weeks, Scott. So, you know, I mean, I've been real nice. I mean, do not allow me to revert back to the old ways. All right. Uh, I'll see, I see y'all later. We're going to go to a break. We come back. We're going to play the Reggie Hutton interview for the Black Godfather as we celebrate uh, Clarence Avon, who passed away son at the age of 92. We'll be right back with Roller Martin. I'm Question for you. Are you stuck? Do you feel like you're hitting a wall and it's keeping you from achieving prosperity? Well, you're not alone. On the next Get Wealthy with me, Deborah Owens, America's Wealth Coach, you're going to learn what you need to do to become unstuck and unstoppable. The fabulous author, Janine K. Brown, will be with us sharing with you exactly what you need to do to finally achieve the level of financial success you desire through your career. Because when I talk about being bold in the workplaces, I'm talking about that inner boldness that you have um, to, to take a risk, to go after what you want, to speak up uh, when others are not. That's right here on Get Wealthy, only on Black Star Network. On the next A Balanced Life with Dr. Jackie, we're talking all things mental health and how helping others can help you. We all have moments where we have struggles, and on this week's show, our guests demonstrate how helping others can also help you. Why you should never stop giving and serving others on the next A Balanced Life here on Black Star Network. Hi, my name is Freddie Ricks. I'm from Houston, Texas. My name is Sharon Williams. I'm from Dallas, Texas. Right now, I'm rolling with Roland Martin. Unfiltered, uncut, unplugged, and undamn believable. You hear me? Entertainment mogul uh, Clarence Avon died on Sunday, the age of 92. In 2019, Reggie Hutland produced and directed a Netflix documentary called The Black Godfather. It was the first time many people even knew uh, who Clarence Avon was, how he impacted the careers and lives of so many different people. I was at the American Black Film Festival that year where I did a Q&A with Reggie. After the Q&A, he and I sat down for a conversation about The Black Godfather, and here it is. I hope you enjoy it. Let's talk about Black Godfather, Reggie Hutlin. Um, this is, first of all, it, an absolutely amazing documentary. And what I love is for someone, I, I know Clarence, you know Clarence, but for that person out there who has no idea who the hell this black guy is, he was, he is, not was, he is 
the man who everybody wants to know. Absolutely. You know, one of the most gratifying things is uh, you see people who, who know Clarence very well who go, you actually got him. You got the whole him, uh, which is very touching. And what is, what is interesting about it, what's interesting about it, again, when you see... Uh, when you see the documentary and, and you, you're hearing these stories and you're going, seriously? Seriously? Especially the one where you had CBS and, and making E.T. and all these different people at the table and they're like, well, who is Clarence here for? Well, Clarence is actually here for all of us and how he is the ultimate connector, if you will. Right. That's why I always try to have at least two or more people telling a story. A, just to get all those different perspectives on mm -hmm. it, and also to confirm it really happened. Because these stories are kind of unbelievable. You go, wait, this guy did all those things? And you go, yes, yes, yes. All these things are confirmed. What was also, I think, it, what was important is that when you, when you look at the telling of this story, the fact that you had this white man who was in the business who became... Um, Clarence's Sherpa, his guide, somebody who said, I am going to show you the business, but I'm also going, uh, I, can, I also recognize something in you that's also valuable for what we do. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's an extraordinary experience, uh, an extraordinary relationship between him and Joe Glazier. Um, there was, there was well, he a, called Mr. Glazier. Always I just, Mr. Glazier. Throughout, throughout the entire documentary, he always says, Mr. Glazier. Doesn't right. say Joe. No, no. And in the same way, you know, when you are around people who work with James Brown and they only say Mr. Brown, mm -hmm. you just go, oh, that's that old school thing where you do that and you always do that. That person could be gone for 40 years. They will only say Mr. Glazier, Mr. Brown. There's this great story, uh, not in the film, um, where Joe Glazier loved baseball. Uh, he had a section at Yankee Stadium, right? When there was a nameplate that said Joe Glazier, where he sat. <laughs> and so he would call Clarence and go, uh, we're going to the, going to the Yankee game. Um, pick you up at 6.30. So they'd be walking down to the seats and Clarence would stop because at a certain point, black people aren't supposed to go. So Joe would turn around and go, what's wrong with you? Because oh, I'm not supposed to be done there. So you with me. And... <laughs> Not only would he take Clarence down there, he would tell, hey, Governor Dewey, move over. This is Clarence's seat. He sit next to me. <laughs> and he would tell Clarence, just listen, you're going to learn some stuff. That is wild. And, what Clarence, and then what he is seeing is he is seeing how power is wielded. Yes. And J Joe's statement at the end of that is like, um, this is going to be a little... Well, it, you know, in the vernacular, uh, Joe would say, they shit just like you shit. Like, <laughs> there's no reason for you to defer to anyone, whether they're a movie star or a politician, whoever. They're all just people just like you. What's also, I think, compelling about this particular documentary is the fact that here is someone n not more than a ninth grade education, but it shows people the value of the other education, the one that you cannot get in a classroom. Absolutely. Clarence grew up in an environment where it was a fight to survive. It was a fight to survive in a home with an abusive stepfather. It was a fight to survive in a town you know, infested with Klansmen, where you couldn't walk down the street without a possible threat to your life. And so through that, he developed not only the instinct uh, of how to survive, he maintained a value system that said, I'm going to fight for right. And that's quite exceptional, because you can get into a survival mode and be very selfish. Well, I, I, you know, I, I, it's just, you know, I'm fighting to live. I'm fighting to live. And, but it's like, but uh, no, no, no. Let's fight for right. Let's fight to protect people who are defenseless. 
that's a different, higher um, m mental state. They actually give me the wind up. I, I know. I'm not. It's it's never gonna happen. <laughs> no. That's, 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 <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. Y'all <laughs> about to get cussed out over there. No, we're. Uh, who is that? Me and Kevin already had a different conversation. All right, let's go. So here's one of the things that also I thought is it. So there's, there's this point in, this, in the documentary where you, this is five white guys, mm -hmm. all of these music heads, mm -hmm. all of these folks are sitting there and talking about him. And I'm watching it, and I'm literally saying, why was why is it Clarence in one of those positions? Because I because they're talking about his brilliance. They're talking about just how this dude, just how smart he is. And I'm going, why the hell isn't he in one of those positions, earning the millions and millions of dollars and not having to have a couple of his friends bail him out when his record label goes under and loses the radio station? And it, and, and and I thought about other African Americans who just as smart, just as brilliant, but never got to sit in that top seat. Look, I agree. Uh, I think in the unique case of Clarence, I think Clarence ultimately decided he didn't, he loved making deals, he loved connecting people, but he didn't enjoy being an operator. You know, so even though he had two record labels, he had a radio station and all that, what he liked most was the deal and the hunt. So I think in the back half of his life, he said, that's what I like to do. This is, the, you know, so I'm gonna focus on that. That said, there are so many enormously talented people who do not get the shot that they deserve. Uh, and the opportunity to prove themselves, the opportunity to mess up, mm -hmm. and then get a second and sometimes third shot, um, and that's a shame. And hopefully this movie will inspire more people to ask that same question that you just did. It took you three years to do this. Mm -hmm. um, an enormous number of celebrities who, who, who were in this. And you watch it and you go, dang, who didn't this dude connect with? Absolutely. And here's the thing. He didn't just connect with them, work with them, do a deal with them. Those people still feel a very deep connection to the point when, when you call and say, we're doing a documentary for Clarence, they all say yes. Two presidents say yes. You know, uh, two of the greatest sports legends ever, Jim Brown, you know, Henry Aaron say yes. Unbelievable. But they say this guy made a meaningful difference in my life. I, I love the Coca-Cola story and Hank Aaron, uh, how Clarence just called, and, and I don't use the N-word, but basically he, he, he tells his white CEO, black folks buy Coke. A lot of Coke. And... I mean, just straight up. And the thing is, he walks into the boardroom, he pulls his chair up to the desk, so basically, it might as well be his desk as much as the CEO's desk. Doesn't say hello. Just cuts right to... We buy a lot of coke. And that's the beginning of the negotiation. Now, you know how it's going to go if that's... <laughs> right. If, if that's the beginning of it, you know how this thing is going to happen. Absolutely. What do you... Clarence is 88. I called him a few days ago, and he said, man, I've gotten more calls from around the world than I ever have in my life. Um, there's so much we can learn from, from watching documentary like this here. I think about the Jerry Weintraub book, uh, that documentary. There was so much I learned reading it in terms of how you deal with people, how you negotiate, how you visualize things. What do you want a young African-American or somebody of any race? And because Netflix is also worldwide, there are people all around the world seeing this. What do you want them to learn from this that they can use no matter what their field is? Clarence's ability to evolve is unbelievable. This is a guy, I mean, ninth grade education, Climax, North Carolina, sharecropping, which is virtual slavery, right? That's not a promising start. But somehow, he made the most out of any window of opportunity he was given. And he was able to rise to the occasion to the point that he's sleeping in the Lincoln bedroom of the White House. He's 
doing deals with the top power brokers in New York and L.A. It's because he never hit a ceiling where he wasn't competent anymore. He kept having curiosity. He kept learning. And he never said, here's these external reasons that have stopped me from getting what I want. He always checked himself and said, how do I grow to be ready for the next thing? And that's a lesson for every person. I don't care what level you are right now. Last question. You've got a ton of stuff. Yeah. When I interviewed with Harry, when I talked to Harry Belafonte, he did. He had 800 hours worth of content when he did his uh, documentary. Mm-hmm. Um, what the hell are you going to do with all the rest of that stuff? Because I'm taking there's a bunch of stuff you have that you haven't even used. Yeah. There's a bunch of stuff. There's some amazing stories. I just, you know, mentioned one to you. There's a right, which was the one about uh, Joe and the um, and going to the stadium. That wasn't in the documentary. Right. We have an easy hour of stories, just great stories, great deals, great everything. So, look, this movie is so successful. Perhaps we can find a way to show folks some more stuff. Uh, this is called The Black Godfather. Uh, if you uh, have not seen it, you want to see it. It is an amazing documentary. You guys did uh, a, a great job with it. And, and I just appreciate uh, that Clarence uh, laugh for the story to be told. Because I think we need to hear more about figures like him and hearing their stories uh, and also celebrating them while they are still with us. Absolutely. Uh, thanks to the Avon family, thanks to Netflix uh, and the amazing crew uh, that dedicated their lives over all those years to make it happen. Okay, one, I'm like a Baptist preacher, one final question. Okay, you did this here. Is there a doc of someone? living or deceased, that you would love to do? There's several. There's people that I want to do, and there's also subject matters Got and it. events. Got it. Right? So, I mean, this is my first feature-length documentary. Uh, it seems to be very enthusiastically received. So in addition to feature films and television and comic book and live events, I'm going to mix a little documentary action into my uh, future line of product. All right. Sounds good. Yes, Always sir. good seeing you, my brother. Always. Appreciate it. Thanks a bunch. Yes, sir.